Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the astrological forecast for the entire month of April of 2023. Joining me today are astrologers Austin Kopic and Robert Weinstein. Hey, both of you. Hey. 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 All right. Um, let me first start by giving an overview of the astrology of April, just to give a snapshot of what we're going to be talking about in this episode. Um, then we're going to come back and do a detailed sort of review of the major news stories that have happened over the past month and the astrology that correlated with them in the first hour of this episode. Then in the second hour, we're going to jump into looking at the astrological forecast uh, for April in more detail. Uh, does that sound good to both of you? Excellent. No, I'd like to change. I'd like to change the whole script. Um, right, just something totally different, Chris. Flip the script. Flip it all around. Not this time, my friend. All right, here we go. <laughs> here we go. All right, here's our lovely graphic of the astrological alignments from our year ahead poster that Paula Bellomini designed for us. So the first thing that happens in April is we get Mercury transiting out of Aries and moving into the sign of Taurus on April third. Then a few days later, we get our first lunation of the month, which is a full moon in the sign of Libra on the 6th of April. The following week, on the same day, we get Venus ingressing into the sign of Gemini on the 11th. And the same day, there's a very auspicious looking uh, Sun-Jupiter conjunction uh, at the same time in the sign of Aries. The following week, we get a solar eclipse in the sign of Aries, right at the very last degree of that sign on the 20th of April, and then later the same day, the sun departs from Aries and moves into Taurus. The following day, Mercury slows down and stations retrograde on the 21st of April, and then it will spend the next three weeks retrograde and moving backwards in the signs of the zodiac rather than forwards. So those are some of the major alignments this month. There's also a few other minor alignments that we'll be talking about in terms of planetary aspects. Um, a lot of planets, for example, when they change signs, will be immediately aspecting either Pluto or Saturn this month, since both of those planets recently changed signs. We'll be talking about that a lot during the course of this episode as we get some of our first um, activations of Saturn in Pisces and Pluto in Aquarius as different planets change signs and move into an aspect with those planets. All right. Welcome, both of you. Uh, Robert, thanks for joining us today. So this is your second time on the podcast. The last time I had you on was back in 2020 when we did the episode on Bitcoin and astrology um, shortly after a major eclipse that coincided with what was then like the high point of the price of Bitcoin when it hit, it hit a new high on the day of an eclipse. And then shortly after that sort of skyrocketed over the next year or two, right? Yes, especially with um, Jupiter in the sign of Aquarius. Uh, one thing we've seen a lot of is that Aquarius is a very important sign uh, for cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. So Pluto moving into Aquarius is going to be very interesting for cryptocurrencies. Yeah, and we've continued to see over the past year or two how important eclipses have continued to be for some strange reason, coinciding with major turning points in Bitcoin and its uh, continued integration into other world currencies and, and effect on other world currencies and banking systems. So that's why I wanted to have you on today, because there's so much going on with the banking industry over the past month um, that I thought you'd, you would be a good person to talk to about that. So we'll we'll talk about that here soon. Um, Austin, how are you doing? How are you how are you doing with the recent um now that Saturn is officially in Pisces? We released our, our Pisces episode together and, and people have been universally hailing that. So I think we were able to pull that one off pretty well, um, given given everything. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was um I, I think that was the one good thing to do with Mercury and Pisces was just talk about <laughs> Pisces for three and a half hours. Right. Exactly. But um, um I, I did feel, I, you know, I, I had my ideas about what it, what Saturn and Pisces would bring for me, like short term and long term. <clears throat> but experientially, within a, the first couple of days, I just felt a heaviness that I hadn't felt before. It felt like a very, like, I don't know, like a two ton sort of melancholy barnacle had encrusted my little boat quietly mm -hmm. and beneath. It was like, not anything it wasn't about anything in particular it was just a mm. little heavier like a little little bit of a way down um i was like oh that makes sense 
I like that. That would be a good band name, like Melancholy Barnacle or like an album title um, <laughs> for, for this chapter of the Saturn and Pisces part of your book. Um, all right. Well, we'll be talking about that more, Saturn and Pisces and some of the things that have happened. It's been a lot of news stories over the past months. So why don't we talk about some of those and some of the things that they correlated with astrologically since that ongoing process of noting things as they happen is actually really useful and illustrative in terms of continuing to add to our collective understanding of astrology as we view events as they happen and connect the planetary alignments that they correlate with. Um, so one of the ones that was huge for, I think, at least this month is that the artificial intelligence thing is continuing to heat up and it's starting to move faster and faster I feel like than anybody expected almost when it first started to become clear that that was going to be a theme um, as Saturn was leaving an Aquarius and Pluto was moving into Aquarius over the past few months. Um, so one of the things that happened is that the the um, group or the company OpenAI released the latest version of their AI program, um, GPT 4.0, and um, what happened is they released that this month, and then there was a paper published literally, I think it was like 12 hours or 24 hours before Pluto ingressed into Aquarius, which said that um, they had been researching this new AI over the past several months while it was in pre-release. And um, in their opinion, they said that it showed sparks of artificial general intelligence. So this is an actual like academic paper that was published where they analyzed it and they put um, they put the AI through different tests that were increasingly difficult or complex, and they were kind of surprised at, at what a good job it did in passing some of these tests and doing different things. Um, so at one point, one of the statements that they made was, let me see if I can find it, but... Um, yeah, one of the statements they made was, given the breadth and depth of GPT-4's capabilities, we believe that it could reasonably be viewed as an early yet still incomplete version of an artificial general intelligence system. And that phrase, artificial general intelligence, is really important because that's basically um, the keyword that AI researchers use to refer to um, being able to this idea this hypothetical idea of being able to create a human-like artificial intelligence or almost like a sentience um of an of an artificial intelligence and that's the goal that all the uh, the ai researchers are working towards and so what i'm pointing out here is just literally almost the day that pluto ingressed into aquarius um there's this group that published a paper saying that they're seeing sparks of things heading in that direction and I think that's really important to note, because even if we're not there yet, what often happens with ingresses, especially outer planet ingresses, is you start to see changes and you start to see these movements towards heading in a new direction with different topics or different themes. And sometimes at the time, little events can happen that don't seem super significant or momentous at the time. But in retrospect, sometimes years later, when you look back, you realize that that was the turning point where something started to change and started to head in a specific direction, eventually culminating in something more notable later on. But that's something we're all as astrologers paying attention to right now, because there's been so many plat outer planet ingresses recently. And so we're all sort of paying attention to what are the little minor changes happening either in world events or in our personal lives that are kind of pointing in a new directions or new paths that we're about to start taking. And, and I think this is this is one of them. There's something very significant about about that. Yeah, the AI and Pluto and Aquarius like are very clearly linked, and the Pluto and Aquarius is going to tell us that story. One example I'd like to give of your point about how sometimes a single event on an ingress could be very illustrative of a chain of a pattern change to come. Um, so I mentioned that uh, on one of our podcasts before that on the, the day of Pluto's ingress into Capricorn, um, there was a terrorist attack in Mumbai and the these terrorists took over a hotel and held mm -hmm. it. And I remember thinking about that and being like, oh, it's Capricorn. It's not Pluto and Sag anymore. It's not, um, you know, uh, it, it's not a plane crashing into something. It's not like a quick hit and run. It's a takeover. 
Um, and obviously it wasn't about the, the omen was not that the terrorists would take over Mumbai. Um, uh, it was that um, there was a shift, which we saw a few years later with ISIS, where those groups then moved to occupy territory rather than harass from the edges, like with Sagittarius. Um, and so, so it, it, which, you know, thinking about that example uh, is, uh, it's interesting because it, it, the pattern is right there, but you had to read the right thing about it, right? right. Um, you know, it, it'd be easy. It's in some ways it's good to know to look at these ingresses, but it's also easy to make um, to uh, permanentize or assume assume something about that which isn't the core of it will you know will happen for you know will be the dominant pattern. Prophecy yeah. problems, right? For sure. And it, the issue with omens in general. Um, but definitely, I mean, it's been striking over the past month that companies are literally, all of the big companies are scrambling and sort of falling all over each other to be the first to take advantage of this new emerging technology and capitalize on it. And I'm already seeing the way that it's starting to transform things like stock photo sites, for example, like I mm -hmm. use Adobe stock when I go on to find stock photos. And a couple of weeks ago, I was looking for images for an episode and amongst the usual like stock photos that had been, you know, either hand done by somebody, an illustrator, uh, you know, over the years or what have you, I could start seeing uh, AI generated images in the stock photo sites. And I realized that that was now completely transforming that entire business model where um, making a stock image doesn't require necessarily a single human spending days or hours you know, creating some sort of image from scratch, but now people are starting to use AI to generate those, which is really going to change a lot of things when it comes to people's income, like different graphic designers, for example, um, but also the stock photo companies themselves, they don't want to get left behind in this. So some of them like Getty Images and Stock Photo are, are starting to sign license agreements with different AI companies in order to have their own image generators. So it's one of those things where I think part of Pluto and Aquarius is going to be this almost like threat of evolving technologically or this pressure to evolve and adopt new technologies or the threat of potentially being left behind in some instances and the tension between those things as different companies and different individuals have to play that out and like make hard choices and decisions when it comes to things like that. I just wanted to add one one thing to your point, Chris. Uh, I think that um, the using the Egyptian terms of Aquarius, the initial um, term is uh, Mercury. So that may be one of the things we're seeing the emphasis on the artificial intelligence um, with the ingress. Hmm. But that's really interesting. And the first uh, the first decan is Venus, where so we have all of the uh, you know the the impact on um, visual adornment. That you were just talking about chris yeah so it's it's like that with images but it's other companies where this is slowly seeping into the business models and, and into things that people do sometimes to make money for example adobe has recently released or, or, or released some sort of beta of an audio program that just automatically adjusts and really improves the audio of um, podcasts. And I've seen clips where people will feed in just like really terrible sounding audio from like a built-in computer microphone where they've got an echoey room or with all sorts of noise around it. And they'll feed it into this, this new program by Adobe that will automatically using AI, get rid of all of the background sounds and make it sound like a studio level recording with like a deep, you know, $400 um, podcast microphone just using AI. So there's just like really crazy technologies like that. But then of course, that will in and of itself then affect um, audio editors, for example, where there's... Uh, I was talking with my brother. Um, we were talking around Christmas and he, uh, who, you know, is an audio editor. And he was saying that he was like, yeah, um, he's like, I will be, um, he's like, I will be irrelevant soon. Yeah, I mean, he was, Stephen was our former audio editor for many years. He's moved into working with other. And Chris big... fired him and replaced him with a robot. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, for one, welcome our new robot audio <laughs> editing overlords and don't want them to do anything to harm us. But no, Stephen just like got a better job. But we worked together for many years, and he would painstakingly, you know, sometimes spend days going through episodes of the astrology podcast, editing the audio 
particularly to make Austin mm-hmm. sound good, which, you know, is, is always important, but, um, things like that might be another instance where, where technology may make certain jobs obsolete because of the ability to automate it. And I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg there because there's so many other instances where technology like that could really move into other companies and completely transform things. And I think that's very reminiscent already of Pluto and Aquarius. Mm-hmm. And I'm almost, mm-hmm. even though we caught this and started seeing this late last year with Saturn and Aquarius, I'm almost surprised at how fast and how rapidly it's all moving. I like that you introduced the um, the sort of paradigm or framework of an evolutionary pressure, um, the, uh, you know, adapt or perish. Right. Um, because, you know, uh, Pluto is often described in evolutionary terms, but in a sort of spiritual unfolding sense. But uh, I often see Pluto do the very Darwinian um, the environment has changed and you need to figure out how to adapt hmm. or, you know, or what is the word? Uh, yeah. Uh, Obsolescence. Being, yes. Or, or become obsolete. Um, right. And that Pluto sweeps that, away the obsolete. Yeah. Or it just gives you an environment that will sweep you away if you don't adapt to it. Um, and exactly. so anyway, I like, like that kind of pressure, um, that kind of pressure and framework, I think is one of the be- one of the top tier ones for thinking about Pluto. And so that being explicitly um, Aquarian technological makes a lot of sense. And I <clears throat> I hadn't thought this until I just gave my uh, the, the example of the last ingress with the Sag into Capricorn. Um, but Pluto's really good for tracking um, the 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 uh, the dominant patterns of murder and terror. Um, you know, it's, uh, you can track the history of serial killers in the United States and what kind of crimes are popular by Pluto. Um, you can also, again, you know, I just give an example of um, of terrorism. I, you know, I wonder. Uh, it makes sense that we would be entering the age at the, you know, dipping our our toe in the pool of uh, technological terror or attacks on the virtual, right? Where, yeah, you know, the yeah. the. Yeah, like the the violence done by the outsiders is yeah is directed towards the Aquarian things because as we get these mm. more, you know, um, infinitely more not infinitely, um, much more sophisticated and therefore fragile structures, it becomes, um, I, I suppose, inevitable as a point of attack. Anyway, well, also yeah. power struggles. I think like you're seeing these, uh, you know, now you're seeing like with with AI, right? You're seeing this fierce corporate co- competition taking place over who's going to have the dominant AI. Mm-hmm. So, and that also is what we talked about earlier too, with like China and the U.S. Also, you know, with Pluto and Aquarius, we're talking about like technology is power, and who has the high tech is going to have the power. I think we're going to see a lot of battles over technology who has the dominant AI, who has the microchips, who has the advanced technologies to win wars and to win, you know, economically. Um, so or who's I think in we're control seeing that playing of the, out. Or who's in control of the social media networks is the, is the big one this week of, um, I, there's like on, on Capitol Hill in Washington this week, they're like questioning the head of TikTok and there's been some movements in some quarters to like try to ban TikTok in the US or to force their parent company to sell them to like a US company or something Mm -hmm. like that because of um, fears or concerns surrounding what is quickly becoming one of the most popular social networks in the US being controlled by a foreign foreign country or foreign power by, by China essentially. Yeah. And I think there's some law in China where the government can request they turn over all information um, that they've accumulated. There could be if TikToks on government officials' phones uh, that has intelligence consequences. Oh yeah, and I just for, I just remembered also one of the other things is the AI generators are getting really good over the past month, and they were struggling like a few weeks ago with hands. Like if you saw an AI image, one of the quickest tells that it was AI generated was the hands would have like too many fingers on them. But now some of the image generators have figured out a way around that and they're starting to Mm -hmm. do hands well. But some of the first political memes, that was something that happened this week that I think is very relevant to Pluto and Aquarius as well as Saturn and Pisces, Mm -hmm. is um, people had been worried about the potential for some of this being abused for political purposes. And there was this image um, that came out of Trump uh, where he was like being arrested 
uh, on the street earlier this week because there had been a big, he, he himself had put out an announcement that he was about to be arrested on Tuesday. And while that didn't happen, somebody made an AI gen generated image that made it look like he was being tackled by a bunch of uh, police officers or something. So we've had our one of our first instances this week of AI mm. being used in order to do sort of political type, I don't want to say propaganda, but like mm. influencing things politically or, or spreading around something that's not true, mm. even if it looks true at face value. Yeah, and there's a really sort of easy tie in there between Pluto, Pluto's ingress into Aquarius and um, the Saturn Neptune years, right? Where it's right. Like, I, I don't know what's real, right? It's, it's the technology that's um, enabling that, but the effect is very Saturn Neptune and Pisces. Yeah, because that was the big mm -hmm. thing that we noticed and talked about a lot back in 2017 when Saturn was square Neptune was that was the year of mm -hmm. like quote unquote oh, yeah. fake news and social media being used and like fake news stories being circulated in order to manipulate um, both sides of the political spectrum and to manipulate the outcome of the election. Um, but here, yeah. And, and Pokemon Go, right? And Teenagers most hunting, yeah, hunting made up creatures uh, in the real world. Yeah, there, you know, you know, in physical locations. I've got to find it, but there's some augmented reality thing that's getting ready to launch right now that um, I actually saw and bookmarked specifically because it reminded me of that. And I was really surprised that, um, yeah, that we might be back in that territory. Well, Poke if... and Pokemon is a, was released under the last Saturn and Pisces. So it seems like a very natural trajectory. Yeah, here I don't I didn't look into this much, but here it is. It's called Peridot, but it it's looks it's like an advanced version of like Pokemon Go, I think. Yeah. So yeah, that... Saturn in Saturn not in Pisces. Kids. <laughs> not your... Yeah, I can't wait to yeah. Um sometimes it's hard to tell what's what because there were the two ingresses were so close together. It's like yeah, what are the correlation? Which one well, is doing what? It was right. A... Well, and the things that are supported by both would be the most likely to occur, right? Which were, yeah. What, which was which were those? <laughs> That's the thing is, it's not one or the other necessarily. <laughs> well, and then Mars going into Cancer too, but um, yeah, I mean March was March was probably one of the more complex months of the entire year, uh, because of that double ingress like that. Yeah, yeah and, I think it well, was understated. It, huge energy ways, shift. I mean, just I, like I think we all felt the the energy shift. You know, of it, course, with the banking crisis is the biggest manifestation. But it, so you know, I I haven't like done polls to confirm this, but nor would I. Um, but it seems like the general sense right now, um, just like the tone I get from a smattering of um, media and people. Um, is that there is a sense that we've sort of entered a new thing um, with a lot of uncertainty, um, which is different than the, uh, you know, the, should we say, the consistent uncertainties and frustrations of the last several years. There really does seem to be a, like a, a set, like even for, you know, for people who aren't tracking the astrology that like, oh, Saturn just changed signs, like Pluto is changing signs. They're like, we're on the, the cusp of cycles of a variety of lengths all of which are at least a couple of years um and that we're just toe dipping in and it, it it does seem like the level of uncertainty is extremely high well you um, know what was interesting too about march uh which was the story that you didn't hear about is like what I, what i'm seeing is like the pandemic is kind of over guys um deaths are down cases are down hospitalizations are down when was the last time you saw a big story in the news about the pandemic and I'm really thinking, you know, Saturn and Pisces, maybe that the end of that period of Saturn and Aquarius really tracked with the pandemic, not exactly, but pretty tightly, a lot of rules, yeah. social distancing, mass vaccine mandates, a lot of really strict rules about social interaction with Saturn in Aquarius. And now all of a sudden that's kind of eased, right? And maybe mm -hmm. we didn't even notice. Uh, no, people aren't really wearing masks. I'm not hearing any, nobody's protesting about vaccine mandates and Nobody's there's not that level of concern. COVID is still out there. You can still get it. But I, I'm thinking the pandemic is really winding down. And that I mean, maybe that, uh that's true to a certain in, extent. Uh but... Saturn in in, in uh, Pisces. That's true to a certain extent when it comes to policy. And we certainly are at the end where most of the major policies have 
um, that were from the COVID early parts of the COVID era have been ended relatively recently. Um, and we probably won't see a return to some of those, but at the same time, the, you know, COVID itself didn't end. And I know no. at least, I, I know like one astrologer that got seriously sick last month. I know one very prominent astrologer that's actually sick right now. And that I'm really hoping pulls through, um, as well as I was talking to a younger astrologer who just got it last year, who's suffering, uh, dealing with severe long COVID issues that have seriously changed her entire life and, and seriously hampered um, her ability to, to you know, live and do things normally. And that's something I'm still struggling with three years later. So that's something I want to like put in there is like COVID's not over. And while most people have rolled back and don't wear masks and everything, and that makes sense, and, and a lot of the public policies have changed in the long term, I do still think there's going to be a story that becomes clearer over the next like five to 10 years about what the actual physical and long-term impacts of COVID and that that might be more serious than people realized in some instances, um, but it has yet to be seen. Well, I'm not, I definitely am not downplaying the effects of COVID. I just want to make that clear. And I'm kind of differentiating between COVID, the illness and COVID, the pandemic, the global emergency crisis pandemic. Yeah. The historical cultural era. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, people are going back to life as normal. People are still getting COVID and getting sick, but we're still, we're going to concerts again. We're going to uh, parties again. We're going to events and life is kind of returning to normal without the fear of the, you know, the Saturn with dignity and Aquarius seem to really ramp up the fear of like, man, I'm afraid to go outside. Like that kind of thing is over. We're, yeah. We're, um, we're getting, we're, we're afraid of new things. Or different things, right? <laughs> well, mean, we're not sure if there's a, the bank is going to, our ATM is going to work, but <laughs> uh, we're I mean, not afraid to go to the grocery store. Yeah. I mean, the definite, the emphasis and attention on COVID and the fear surrounding it has definitely shifted. But um, part of the way that life is going back to normal is through uh, somewhat of a lack of awareness of the long term impacts that some people are still getting, even after being vaccinated or other things like that. So, I think it remains to be seen um, if that comes back at some point in greater awareness or what that discussion looks like if it turns out that getting COVID still three years later is more harmful or, or worse for a person's health than people currently think. It'll be interesting to see how those discussion goes. Yeah, definitely. Well, and you know, as far as getting back to normal, I don't think people feel like they're getting back to normal. They're getting, it's coming out the other side of a thing, but things are different. Um, you know, wars back on the table, like, you know, you know, we had plague, then war, um, you know, uh, famine is threatening in various places. Like it's, it's not back to, you know, we didn't pop back out in 2019. Uh, it's very For much sure, like yeah. looking around and with a lot of uncertainty. And, you know, it's one of the things about, about Pluto is um, Pluto always brings uncertainty and always brings, um, you can't see it very clearly right? Like the uh, clarity of vision and Pluto do not go together. But like, how deep is this hole? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, I can't, I, I dropped a penny down it and I can't, I didn't hear it hit the bottom of the well. And so then we fill that well with um, projections. Sometimes, and I don't mean projections merely in a psychological sense, but we try to project what might be down or, or imagine it. Um, and that space is also um, catnip for uh, fears and anxieties. Right. And I feel like, again, this this other side of the tunnel that we've come out of is full of unknowns um, that are easy, uh, necessary to 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 fill with uh, models or ideas of what it might become, um, but also very easy to fill, fill with anxiety and fear. That yeah. feels like the end of a chapter, that three year chapter, mm -hmm. now that Saturn's moved out of Aquarius and into Pisces and that we're moving into new territory or at least starting that journey of finishing one chapter of a book and opening up another. It was actually really interesting to see a lot of the like Saturn and Aquarius people in their late 20s or early 30s finishing up their Saturn returns and reflecting on that and reflecting on some of those <clears throat> stories. It was kind of heartening to see, but that goes to the point about this being things being diff radically different now on the other side of Saturn and Aquarius compared to what everyone's life was like when we went in. Well, that's, you know, I was looking back at the uh, Saturn, you know, last ingress, into Pisces, I believe it was uh, 1964, 65. And that was right after the Kennedy assassination. 
which was also like a generationally changing event, you know, and there was like this really sense of loss and, um, you know, this kind of like dreams kind of dashed. And I think there's, I mean, totally different, but we're, we're also coming out of a really rough period where a lot of, you know, it was just a really depressing period where a lot of dreams were kind of crushed. Um, so that I see that Saturn, that same kind of themes coming out of a really hot, you know, really difficult period with Saturn and Aquarius. Yeah. And um, certainly the same was true 30 years before that. Yeah. Right. Because <laughs> we have the that, Great Depression. We yeah. have that like double, the double Saturn in its own signs, right? Was it 29 to 34? Um, and then, yeah. yeah, the, um, you know, the, yeah, that mid 60s when people talk or the early 60s, when people talk about the 60s, they're actually talking about the second half of the 60s, right? Because the first <laughs> right. half of the 60s is Saturn and Capricorn and Aquarius, and it looks like the 50s it's locked down it's buttoned down maybe rather than locked down yeah, but yeah totally. and, and yeah and that emerging into saturn pisces is you know it's a very natural so what the fuck is going on like so what is this um there's someone in the comments forgive me for not seeing the name i just saw it popped up but the, the 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 new it's sort of new normal but it feels transitional it's a mutable saturn without a lot of dignity it's sort of you know it's in a water sign like yeah this is how it is for now but there's nothing um, that feels particularly permanent about Saturn and Pisces. Yeah. And, and so going back and speaking of ingresses, maybe we should talk then about the other really major thing that started happening in terms of world events this month that a lot of the astrologers were associating and connecting with Pluto, which was the banking crisis that came up. Um, and I know a lot of astrologers were talking about it because it was striking that it was happening when Pluto was right in the last degrees of Capricorn, because of course, um, all the astrologers that were around in 2008, remember during the last major financial, also banking crisis that occurred right when Pluto was moving into Capricorn in the very first degrees of the sign. So there was something very fitting about it, sort of starting with a banking crisis and ending with a banking <laughs> crisis for some reason. So what what's the short version for people that like weren't paying attention to the news? What's the synopsis, Robert, of what happened there exactly? Oh man, that it's such a complex it's a complex story. But I will try to give you the short version. Um, okay. I mean that thing just came. First of all, it just kind of came out of nowhere, right? Like it. What was really interesting was that the Fed Chair Chairman Powell testified in front of Congress, I believe, on. Um, let me just look at it was Tuesday the 7th and uh, Wednesday the 8th he, the banking crisis was not even mentioned one time mm -hmm. that was right at the ingress of Saturn into Pisces and then all of a sudden it was on Thursday and Friday that the Silvergate Bank which was the crypto bank failed and then a day or two later you had the Silicon Valley Bank which was a really important bank for the tech industry and venture capital also failed. And then it started a, a couple more banks failed. Um, and so, you know, whether it was related more to Pluto Aquarius or Saturn Pisces, that was one of the things I think is a little hard to tell. All of a sudden, as we as we had talked about, like liquidity, bank liquidity dried up right when Saturn, literally right when Saturn hit Pisces. Now, the causes of the bank crisis are basically three. Banks were holding large bond portfolios that got killed. 2022 was the worst year for bonds in 50 years, 40, 50 years. So they're holding all these bonds and they're, so their capital is dropping because bond value dropped. You also had deposit flight looking for higher interest. Uh, and so all of a sudden, boom, and technology played a big role in that. And that might be the Pluto and Aquarius part because all of a sudden now people used to have to go to the bank physically right? To, to a run on the bank, you had to actually go to the bank to get your money out of the bank. And now you just swipe your, you just swipe your phone and you can move all your funds in a, in a second. And that actually contributed to the speed of the crisis that took everybody by surprise. Interesting. Um, so, so part of it is there, there was a bank run basically. And that's, that's part of the reason why Silicon Valley bank failed, right? Yeah. Um, you know, social media and phones kind of mm -hmm. teamed up. A rumor gets going on social media. This also happened with FTX last year. You know, a couple of big crypto influencers started posting, oh, if I were you, I would draw my FTX funds now. Boom, that started a cascading kind of run on the bank there. So things can move very, very fast in the digital age here. Um, and one, so- One person in the comments is saying, and I thought this too, that 
um, some of this current banking crisis was partially connected to um, some of the banking things that occurred in November because of the tie-in with with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, right? Uh, that was with Silvergate. That was with the Silvergate Bank, particularly, which was a crypto industry bank. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, this is a really complex story. The, the government is making a concerted effort to make it much harder for big crypto institutions to bank. So there's that's a subplot. But I wouldn't say that that's kind of one of the main driving forces. It all goes back to the Fed messing up on inflation. Remember when the Fed said, oh, a little bit of inflation would be good? People remember that back in 2021. Well, that turned out to be a historic mistake. So in order to combat inflation, they had they raised interest rates the sharpest they've raised them in 40 years. Right. Very and that, was and that the... put pressure on the banks, number one, because it collapsed the bond market. But number two, big, bigger picture, it just started removing liquidity from the banking system and the financial markets and the economy to bring down inflation. And it right. showed up, it showed up, boom, with a, a banking crisis that nobody expected. So it all so, goes back to inflation and the Fed, Fed, what the Federal Reserve is doing. Um, and I just there's a really good documentary on Frontline, if you guys like pause, Frontline. Pause for a second. Pause for a second. So astrologically, to keep this grounded in the astrology, sure. all the astrologers and us were talking about Jupiter and Pisces, um, Jupiter and Neptune conjoining in Pisces and associating that with a lot of the inflation that we saw. Um, that occurred between 2021 and 2022. What was the time frame on that transit again? Because it, it was like extenuated because there was an early ingress into Pisces. So it ended up going much longer than it normally would, right? Yeah, it was cut into chunks. That yeah. was, uh, I remember it was in April of last of, la of 2022 was the conjunction of Venus, Jupiter and, and Neptune. Yeah, although there was, I think the previous year in 2021, there may have been a little dip into Pisces already. So it just extended it. And that really coincided right. with um, inflation mm -hmm. and all the prices were going up. And that was the big story financially last year is all the prices on everything were going up due to inflation with Jupiter conjunct Neptune, which are both um, planets of sort of like growth and expansion and lack of boundaries. Um, but then um, during the course of last year, the Federal Reserve in the US was trying to combat inflation by rising in interest rates. And this, especially in the second half of the year, um, Austin, you were associating the Mars Neptune square with bubbles bursting or bubbles popping. And mm -hmm. it was notable around the October, November timeframe when they were raising the rates a lot, um, that that seemed to coincide with some of the what looked like at the time um successful attempts to get the inflation under control by sort of popping that inflation bubble it seemed like yeah yeah well and um we also had the ftx event um right on like very close to the exact mars neptune and you know last month i said about this mars neptune that happened in march well if there are bubbles left you know hydro bubbles and you know lo and behold we got another one Right. And obviously Mars is that Mars Neptune. Mars is the shorter term trigger for popping in an environment created by the longer cycles. Right. Well, and also Mercury, you know, Mercury was debilitated in Pisces and combust the sun. And that was something that I've been talking about. Um, that's that can create kind of a panic. Um, markets and in general, like Mercury was in kind of a double jeopardy. And mm -hmm. it was also conjunct Neptune at the same time. So Mercury, right, Mer that was a mess when Mercury, the Sun, and Neptune conjuncted and they were all squaring Mars. And that's kind of when the crisis went down. So that was like the shorter term trigger of all those those three, uh, four planets together. Right. And so... As we were, as Robert, as we were saying um, uh, before we started recording, like another like simple take on this is that Saturn is in Pisces now and liquidity is not what it used to be, right? Like we have the drying planet, <laughs> right? Um, the, the, the like slowing, drying uh, planet into this place, into Pisces, which has been so um, juiced and juicy because of Neptune and then on and off Jupiter since 2021. And that like Neptune is, or excuse me, Saturn has come to, to dry things up. Totally. Yeah, that makes sense. So where we're at now, and, and one of the reasons I was asking about some of the past stuff is just because 
it seemed like, um, especially with the eclipses, that sometimes there were major events happening on eclipses, like last November, when the whole Sam Bankman Freed scandal and, and financial scandal happened right around the time of the eclipses in November. And that ended up being tied in with some other related Bitcoin thing that happened on eclipses exactly six months earlier. Um, since we're coming up on eclipse season again next month, starting with that eclipse in Aries later in April, I thought it would be good to just understand the connections sometimes between events that are happening now or that are coming up and how sometimes they're not happening in isolation, but as part of a sequence um, with things in, in other increments that we can track with astrology. Well, last year's eclipses, I uh, believe, were you know conjunct Uranus uh, in both times, right? Mm -hmm. uh, both the spring and the fall. Uranus is a planet that, you know, rules technology and crypto, cutting edge technologies, big tech companies and cryptocurrencies. So it can be friend. It can be, you know, usually it's a friend, um, but the it, it got eclipsed basically, right? And I know, uh, I think when I talked to Austin at ESAR, you said, oh man, when planets get caught up in the eclipse, you know, those planets really suffer. And I think that that was a really, you know, that was a key point. Uranus was basically eclipsed. You know, big tech got crushed in 2022 on those eclipses, not just crypto, but I mean, like Netflix, you know, fell like 50%. Amazon fell 50%. So, and and then oh, those eclipses face really, Facebook, oh yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, those eclipses of Uranus, you know, also really hit crypto hard with the co collapse of Luna and then FTX in November. So yeah. uh, the Luna one was right on the eclipse last June, right? Almost to the day. It was it was almost to the, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the the Luna one. Yeah, that was in May, I believe. The May, end of okay. April or May. And, well, and just so, quickly to summarize, what was that again? It was a, a, a form of cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, like an alternative to Bitcoin that just suddenly and unexpectedly collapsed. Yeah, that's right. It was a it was an altcoin. Um, you know, a lot of people said, "Oh, Luna, you know, Luna crashed on the lunar, you know, on the lunar <coughs> eclipse too." Right. So there's sometimes you get those really literal things. But yeah, it was an altcoin, so, but it had like a whole ecosystem, and it had a uh, Terra that was pegged to the dollar, and it was an algorithmic stablecoin, which was like this supposedly you know, amazing technology, but the whole thing was basically kind of a Ponzi scheme. So right. let, let me, I, I just want to point out that these were, so these eclipses, right, with Uranus, also square Saturn. Also um, square Saturn, and, yes. And in Taurus, right, Taurus is the sign that likes stable stores of value. It likes the, the food trucks to deliver the bread on time. It likes the money to, you know, <laughs> uh, to appreciate or depreciate extremely slowly, um, and that, you know, uh, as we head into eclipses later this month, um, it's not the same eclipses where one of them will be in Scorpio, one of them will be in Aries, the, the nodes are still in Scorpio, uh, Taurus, but Saturn is no longer in a fixed sign. And so it's, we've got, a, we've got some of those echoes left, right? We've still got some eclipses that are at least opposed, if not conjoined to uranus Opposed, yeah but we're like we're we're turning the corner into a new set of like a half new set of it's dynamics. a different animal it's a different animal and that's a key point too austin thanks for you know bringing that up the eclipses were caught in between the uranus saturn square and that for financial astrology is the preeminent financial crisis aspect historically and by the way i went back to the crash of 1929 um, and that was also had the nodes in uh, Taurus at Scorpio, North mm. Node in Taurus, I believe, South Node in Scorpio. Uh, and that was, uh, it was the Chiron was involved in, the, in that time. It wasn't Uranus, but the nodes were in the same signs, by the way. But the Uranus Saturn cycle, if you go back 2008, Uranus Saturn cycle, um, you know, 2000, the dot com Uranus Saturn cycle. Uh, 1931 uh, through 33, Uranus Saturn cycle run on the banks. Um, you know, the Dutch tulips, you go back to the 1600s, Uranus Saturn cycle. So Uranus Saturn cycle is the really the cycle of the boom and the bust, the 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 bubble and the crash. Um, and so that the and, it, and when the eclipses line up with that, then you get a real trigger. 
Yeah. And I remember a year ago also with the eclipses, that was one of the first times that the economy really started to shake sort of in general. Um, but so, so we had that Luna bit, uh, coin crash right on an eclipse in like May and June of last year. And then six months later, right on another eclipse, um, the FTX scandal and crash happened with Sam Bankman freed. And I know that he was being investigated for possibly um, being connected with the Luna crash or the Luna crash somehow being connected with what happened then with FTX crashing in November, right? Um, it, it's all connected. I mean, the cryptocurrency space is very small and all the players are interwound together. Um, and well, you know, after that crash, Bankman Fried started kind of stepping in and backstopping the market, which is hilarious, right? In retrospect, there were articles like, oh, Bankman Fried is the new JP Morgan of crypto. Mm -hmm. He's stepping in and he's buying all these distressed companies and he's backstopping. <laughs> well, we now know that that whole thing was just was just a, a house of cards, another Ponzi scheme. Um, so, yeah, it's really... Uh, it's really interesting. It, it, I don't remember the exact connection between between Luna and and Bankman Fried, but um, that yeah. collapse the collapse of liquidity again in the crypto space. You know when the you know as the, the tide comes out, the scams get exposed, and FTX unfortunately was just a massive scam. Yeah, I was just there's a like a New York Times article from back in December that was said FTX founder Sam Bankman Fried is said to face market manipulation inquiry. Federal prosecutors are investigated whether whether he and his hedge fund orchestrated trades in a way that led to the collapse of two cryptocurrencies in May. And it's talking about Luna and Terra. Um, so I just bring all of this up and the connections between these six month increments between eclipses, because we're coming up on eclipses again here next month. And um, it seems like we've got some like recurring, re recurring themes having to do with like inflation and attempts to fight inflation, um, Bitcoin and some of the ongoing issues integrating whether Bitcoin is getting integrated with other currencies and how that's affecting things like banking or, or other currencies and things like that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of different related topics that keep coming up in six month increments here. So that's, I'm cu yeah, curious that's how that will go. Uh, the image that comes to mind uh, when you were talking, Robert, about like, you know, uh, the, the tide going out exposing things is, you know, what 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 can survive or even thrive in a low liquidity environment, right? Like which who are the crabs who do just fine on the seashore, right? <laughs> um, and who are the, the fish who, you know, dry out and bake in the sun? Well, so far, Bitcoin is actually thriving, which is a, somewhat of a surprise. Um, and that, you know, may have to do with uh, Saturn leaving Aquarius, where it was potentially holding down crypto. Uh, so Bitcoin so far is the winner of this banking crisis. It is the outperforming everything else and has flipped into a kind of safe haven. We'll see if that if that holds up. It's going to be interesting. Right, because that's one of the things we saw is that it did Bitcoin did really well when Jupiter was in Aquarius, right? Uh, well, you know, Saturn and Jupiter ingressed together, and 2021, mm -hmm. the entire year Jupiter was in Aquarius. You got the two a uh, new all time highs, and uh, you you know you also had the Saturn, you also had the Saturn Uranus squares, which was in the mania phase where you know everybody was going insane about crypto. Um, so Jupiter and Aquarius was very good for crypto. As soon as Jupiter left Aquarius at the end of 2021, right, the whole crypto market collapsed, basically. And right. it's been a bear market the entire time that Saturn was in Aquarius by itself. Right. And then as soon as Saturn leaved Aquarius, now Bitcoin is is rushing up again. And, and that the the you know the bulk of the rally took place with Venus in Aquarius in January. Uh, Bitcoin went up 50, 60 percent just with Venus mm. in Aquarius. And then the rally kind of continued, but much smaller after Venus left. So Aquarius seems to be a big factor for crypto and as well as the modern ruler Uranus, each of which can really affect the crypto markets transits uh, from other planets. Yeah, I just think that's so interesting, just studying transits to a sign and something like that that you can study objectively using graphs because it has whatever its perceived value is going up and down and then being able to have some you know quasi objective way to study the history of that thing and and the the value of it so this was the chart for bitcoin 
and I believe you use this chart, right? The Leo rising yeah. chart set for London. Yeah, and I pretty much rectified it um, over the past couple of years. I do think that London um, is uh, definitely, well, I'd say high probability the location. Um, and that was based on the eight degree ascendant. Um, and you can go back and look at Jupiter when it's stationed at eight degrees and whenever it crossed eight degrees, Aries, we got some big rallies, but there were some other factors too. But you can see there on the natal chart, a lot of Aquarius, North Node in Aquarius, Neptune mm -hmm. in Aquarius. And in fact, the all-time high of Bitcoin in October, November of 2021, look, Jupiter was exactly conjunct the natal Neptune, right? Talk about euphoria. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, people who are still doubting the Bitcoin natal chart, I think that's really great evidence for it. Yeah. And just to reiterate some history, because it's kind of relevant as we're talking about Pluto ingresses and Pluto entering and departing from uh, signs and sometimes little things starting at the beginning of an ingress that later become big things. Um, the guy that created Bitcoin, the like anonymous, mysterious figure that created Bitcoin. Satoshi he, Nakamoto. Yeah, nobody knows who he is. And he's he's very, he's uh, you know, who knows who he is, but he left something in the code for Bitcoin early on that referred to the financial crisis that was occurring in 2008. And he almost sounded like he was partially motivated um, because he was mad at like the the bank bailouts that were happening at the time or something like that. So it was very much tied in with that initial um, Pluto ingress into Capricorn and the financial catastrophe that was happening in real time at that point, but also the seeds of something that would later become very important in the world over the past decade um, as Pluto has been transiting through Capricorn, which were Bitcoin, were laid at the same time simultaneously. So we're probably going to see something very similar like that that we've got to pay attention to right now, which is we see a major change that happens in the world simultaneous with the transit and the ingress of a planet, but then also the seeds of something are laid at that time as well that will later bear fruit you know, years in the future. True. Uh, Bitcoin was, you know, it does have a Saturn Uranus opposition and it and it has the Pluto ingress into Capricorn. So it really captures the birth chart, captures the energy of that crisis of 2008. And by the way, he, you know, he the quote quoted the Financial Times of London in the Bitcoin Genesis block. So that's the more evidence for the London, the London chart. Right. And, and could you just expand on that or clarify what that point was that he um what his rationale was for creating that technology at the time that he said he, right. he, ref he referred to something about the financial crisis right well there's a you know people are a lot of bitcoiners are gloating right now because they're saying right oh bitcoin was created for this you know the for this banking crisis so you know oh bitcoin's not backed by anything and people are like like but now the banking system is the one that's in crisis so it's kind of interesting. I mean, the supposedly Bitcoin was created to be outside the the mainstream financial system so that it could give you protection from a larger collapse of the mainstream financial system. And so right. a lot of people are saying, "Oh, look, that's what's happening now." How that's that you don't you don't need a bank to store Bitcoin. I guess that's the core of that, right? Well, that's the beauty. That's the beauty of Bitcoin, and that's why I've always been a Bitcoin, a Bitcoiner. Is it's outside of the banking system. It's not controlled by any bank or country or central bank or corporation. It is an independent entity. Sure. I guess I'm just trying to get to understanding the core things here because there's something there to learn about Pluto and Capricorn and what that transit was about. Now that we're reaching the end of it, and there's also something about the seeds of the transit that we're moving into for the next 20 years of Pluto and Aquarius. Well, you, it, you... It, it, let me just jump in. So we are kind of at the end of Pluto in Capricorn, kind of not. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like we're watching a show with multiple character arcs and some of with, with, uh, with Pluto's ingress into Aquarius, one of the characters is starting their next season arc, but we still have like, you know, this is a 10 week ingress we still have um, well over a year of Pluto being in Capricorn to go, right? Like 18 so, months. Okay, 18 months, right? Because um, it, it, there are three total ingresses into Aquarius before it's permanent. And so like this is wrapping up some things, but it's important that we don't say this is the end because we've got a few yeah. more a few more finales, right? Pluto's going to do more at like 20, 28, 29 cap before the... Uh, 
you know, before it's wrapped in a bow and sent off. Yeah, it's like a it's like a stand up comedian that does their entire act and then leaves, but then comes back for an encore, except nobody's excited for that encore and everybody just groans when they come back like three times. Well, it's really <laughs> yeah. a transition. The next 18 months is like the slow transition of Pluto. Pluto into Aquarius isn't like one day, right? It's it's an 18 month transitionary period where we get used to the what is the new era that we're stepping into. Yeah, that and that like the final once Pluto's actually in that overlaps with the transition of Saturn or excuse me of Neptune and Saturn and Uranus changing signs like we're all kind of heading towards that 2025 ish um, um, mass exodus of our ingress slash exodus of outer planets where we get you know we go Neptune in uh, Neptune in Aries Uranus in Gemini with the Pluto in Aquarius like Pluto is um, you know, one of the three big invisibles, um, but they, they all like the, the final ingresses all line up uh, mid decade. Thankfully yeah. in a har harmonious minor grand trine. Yeah. Um, my guess is that harmonious will not be the term that historians use to refer <laughs> to that era. There was, it was 2025, which began the era <laughs> of harmony. Well, at least it's sex thousand trines, right? It could be worse. So they're working with each other, but are they working with each other against us, Robert? And the, the Saturn, <laughs> uh, the Saturn Neptune conjunction takes place, I believe, at zero Aries, right? Yeah, that is Bill Marinian said that that's one of the you know that can cause really huge global events. So um, we'll see. So we'll, we'll get to see. <laughs> so this Everyone is all leading saved. up to that this is all leading up to 2025 yeah i think so i think saturn and pisces is sort of the confusion leading up to but that one last thing i wanted to say for cryptocurrencies i mean um the by the way on the the day of the ingress which was yesterday the sec it was either it was either wednesday or thursday the sec uh announced um aggressive action against coinbase so one of the things I think we're going to see is, and this was all over uh, crypto Twitter, is aggressive moves by governments to try to stop cryptocurrencies. Uh, and there's going to be a power struggle over cryptocurrencies um, with, with Pluto and Aquarius. So this may be one of the things we're going to be seeing. The Gary Gensler, the SEC, the Biden administration, they've all taken very hostile stance against crypto. Um, I know we're not here to talk about crypto, but that's my specialty. So uh, I think that that's that's a big that's a big theme is the government uh, it's trying to gain at least gain control over crypto, if not outright right. stop it. Yeah. And that seems like a theme that we've that's come up in multiple ways here of, of governments um, or organizations or people in power trying to gain control or leverage over technology because the, the people or the person in control of the technology mm -hmm. that everyone's using end up being the people in power. And then that power can be wielded to do a lot of different, either good or bad things. But that's true of like Bitcoin. That's true of AI. Um, you know, we talked about fusion and the year ahead forecast and how that was a big thing that came out with Saturn and Aquarius and some of the promise of that transforming the global energy scheme potentially over the next 20 years, if that becomes more common. I'm sure there's lots of oh, social media is another one we talked about and the attempts to like control that or like what governments or organizations have control over that. Um, so it seems like that's going to be a major theme here. Yeah, it's but, all it's all contested terrain now. Right. And right. also Multiple. like obsolete technologies, like you said, like gas cars, maybe gas cars become completely obsolete technology with Pluto in Aquarius. Yeah, I think that's going to accelerate with Uranus and Gemini. Um, because if, like I was telling you guys before we start recording, even if fusion becomes like widely used, the next step is going to be like, everything needs to be switched to, uh, electric, not just cars, but also like trucks, boats, planes, and all of that. And there's some major hurdles with converting the entire transportation sector to being able to use electric rather than gas or diesel. And that'll be a major transformation over the course of the next, um, 10 to 20 years. Well, the EU has already moved to ban, I think, ban all gas-powered cars, right, by like 2032 or something. I might be a little off on the year, but okay, um, it's happening. That's the end of 
Uranus we'll, we'll and Gemini. see. You're uh, Europe's in the middle of some pretty big stuff. We'll see. I don't know. I'm I'm kind of waiting to see what things look like uh, uh, in Europe a few years from now. You know, the um, the advent of for real, for real land war uh, in Ukraine is, I, I think, changed a lot of trajectories. Yeah, and we've seen some major geopolitical shifts happening over the past month with the ingresses as well. Um, some things are heating up, seeing, um, for example, Saudi Arabia and Iran sign some sort of peace accord or, or moving towards that with uh, the backing of China and China being a major player in helping to coordinate that or, or make it happen basically um, has major geopolitical implications potentially if that actually like stays in place, which is interesting again as an ingress thing of something new or of a new chapter opening up that might not be huge in the moment, but in the long term could could be significant. Um, were there similar geopolitical things? Yeah, you know, just to, you know, just to not recap, but just to summarize, like, I, my suspicion that we're in a very uncertain place is very much confirmed by the trajectory of the conversation where it's like, so here's 40 things that could be really huge and we don't <laughs> know where they're going, right? That's the new normal, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not the, it's not a return to, to, to the known. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. All right. Well, we do need to mention before we wrap up this, that we should wrap up this news section really soon, but I did want to mention really briefly the Oscars since that was a big, uh, in terms of entertainment and in terms of other like notable things that everyone was talking about, the astrology of this month, um, where the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once swept the Oscars and won just tons of awards, as did many of the actors and other people associated with the movie. Um, there was also a major sort of comeback story with um, Brendan Fraser, who won an Oscar for his role in the movie The Whale. Um, and that was kind of an inter interesting thing astrologically to some extent. Um, I know, Austin, you associated that, both that and and I think everything, everywhere, all at once, which came out during the Pisces stellium last year, was a very like Pisces and Aquarius stellium type movie. Did you either of you see it? You know, um, Kate and I sat yeah. down to watch it one night and it was just it was moving too quickly and we were both tired and we said we, we both decided we would like to watch it but not right now and then never got back to it but um from what i understand it sounds very neptune and pisces sounds very appropriate that it um is a it was the victor during the saturn neptune era yeah great movie i enjoyed it immensely very fun yeah innovative. Hear good things very innovative um story kind of yeah. sci-fi kind of kung fu like um yeah not okay. genre what is genre bender yeah and um although we don't have a birth time for her michelle yo, yo won the um award for best actress in that movie and i noticed that she had saturn oh. and aquarius so this was like the very tail end of her saturn return her second saturn return which i thought was really interesting since there were also um, yeah, just different things with like age. And I know she mentioned in her um, like acceptance speech, different things about age and like not being, it's not being like too late to like still win a major award like that, even later in your career. And even though um, actresses have sometimes struggled with that, like casting, like after a certain age or different things like that. So I thought it was interesting that that was part of her like second Saturn return story. Yeah, totally. Well, and um, and also Jupiter re Jupiter return. That movie came out when she was having her Jupiter return in Pisces. Um, yeah, I remember she. I mean, she must have started acting early. I remember seeing her in kung fu movies that were from the early mid eighties. Um, she's been around forever. Yeah, I mean, the big one was like two thousand. Was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and that was. You oh know, yeah, but over... she was she was like big in uh, Hong Kong cinema yeah. a decade decade and a half before that. Okay, that was, was her yeah, breakout it's... to the Western audience. Yeah, but she was like starring roles, um, you know, fifteen years earlier. Got it. Um, and then the other one was Brendan Fraser, and that was really interesting because we actually do have a time chart for Brendan Fraser. And what was interesting to me partially was. Um, Saturn had just departed from Aquarius and moved into Pisces. So it's like he got the role and he did the role while Saturn was in 
um, going through his 10th house. And he's had this kind of like comeback story of this redemption story because he um, had been a big actor in the 90s and early 2000s, but then he struggled with like a series of different setbacks in different parts of his life in the late 2000s and early 2010s. So that maybe like six or seven years ago, there was a bunch of different op-ed pieces of just like what happened to Brendan Fraser and why did he just disappear from the map after being one of the leading stars in Hollywood for like a decade. And um, yeah, it was like a really notable like success story or comeback story. Um, and since he has a time chart, it's just interesting seeing some of the different transits going on uh, for him when he won an Oscar here this month. So um, yeah, the Pluto ingress, of course, went into Pluto um, trined his moon in the first house and that Pluto transit went into his 10th house and Saturn had just departed from his 10th house and moved into his 11th. So it's interesting seeing somebody get like the rewards mm. of a 10th house Saturn transit and um, in some ways also him having a Saturn return back to his 10th house where Saturn would have been going through Aquarius in the mid 90s, early to mid 90s when he, he first had his ascent as an actor. And in his um, acceptance speech, he also mentioned something about like time and age where he talked about how when he was first big in Hollywood in the 90s, um, when Saturn was up in the top part of his chart, how it, it came easily to him. And he had something that was there that he took for granted until it went away. And he didn't fully recognize or appreciate it until it went away. Um, but now all of a sudden he's back sort of at the top of his chosen career or profession. And he had a much greater appreciation for it. I think this second time around of Saturn going through his 10th house and, um, yeah, there was something mm -hmm. really striking there about witnessing that transit of some, with somebody. Yeah, that's interesting also considering that the natal chart has uh, Saturn in its fall in Aries. And there was literally in that rule that Saturn rules the 10th, right? So there's literally a fall from grace and then getting back up again. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, one thing, I don't, I don't want to dwell on this, but looking at uh, Michelle uh, Yao, Yao this chart um, and seeing the Saturn Aquarius, and uh, just made it immediately made me think of, of debates of uh, you know who's the greatest of all time, who are the goats of different fields, um, and of course while Saturn was in Saturn ruled signs um, in uh, mixed martial arts, everybody was talking about goats all the time, and what was really interesting as <laughs> we transitioned out of that era, like three or four people who were maybe going to become the greatest of all time, like these champions with great win streaks, all got cut down. Uh, over the last several weeks, like the, uh, was it two weeks ago, uh, Kamaru Usman, who had, uh, I think, four, I think he had 14 consecutive wins. He was about to have the longest win streak ever, blah, blah, blah. Um, instead of getting his belt back, just um, got uh, sort of permanently, uh, should we say, second tiered. And this happened with a number of different, uh, a number of different fighters. Um, and I'm just curious if some of the discourse with Saturn and longevity um, no longer being as important with Saturn moved out of this, the Aquarius and Capricorn. If some of this like seeking permanence in the memory of a particular field will sort of drain away. Because again, I, I, there, were, uh, there, was a, there was a slaughter of would-be goats over the last six months. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So I think we are definitely more than halfway. We're up to an hour and 10 minutes yeah. in this episode. So we should make a transition to talking about April. Um, I did first want to mention our sponsor for this episode. So there's this new astrology app that's coming out right now that's called Starscribe, which um, I'm actually kind of excited about and which approached me about doing this because um, this is an astrologer I know from social media. And what they've done is they've launched a Kickstarter in order to um, fund this new astrology app that they're working on that looks both really beautiful and has some really great um, things integrated into it for studying and learning astrology. So Starscribe is an astrology journaling app by astrologer Rowan Oliver and software engineer Romina Barrett that launched a Kickstarter just a few days ago. So um, Starscribe is a new astrology journaling planner and social app. And 
Um, it's in the beta, beta phase, but they're running a Kickstarter campaign to fund the development of the mobile app, which is launching for both iOS and Android later this year. Starscribe is the first astrology app to feature techniques sourced directly from Hellenistic astrology, including annual perfections and whole sign houses. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited about it. So Starscribe has upcoming astrologer portal, which will feature the work of professional astrologers from all backgrounds and connect astrology enthusiasts to knowledgeable and reliable astrologers of different traditions from all around the globe. So if you sign up for the Kickstarter, some of the perks include early and discounted access to the app's premium features, exclusive astrology merch designed by Zartana, who's designed some graphics for the astrology podcast in the fact, actually, in the past, and also astrology and web development bundles from Rowan and Remedia. So Starscribe's Kickstarter campaign is running from March 23rd through April 2nd, and you can learn more and back the project at starscribe.co slash Kickstarter. So everybody should sign up and fund this because, you know, there's not actually, even though you, th you would think that there are a lot of different apps for astrology at this point, there's actually not that many astrology apps um, out there. We've got a kind of a limited number of ones, and some of them have, you know, limited functionality compared to others. So it would be really nice to have some more advanced astrology apps out there that have the sort of functionality of being able to do some of the techniques like perfections or other Hellenistic and other timing techniques, as well as to have features like journaling features so that you can actually record what happened to you on different days and start building up your own database of like experiences and observations in terms of astrology. So I definitely encourage everyone to check that out and I'll put a link to it um, in the description below this video on YouTube or on the podcast website in the entry for this for this episode. All right, so that is our sponsor for this month. Shall we transition into getting into the details surrounding April? Chris, can I do, I have one more tie-in um, just on Pluto Aquarius I wanted to mention. Um, the, the, the previous two ingresses featured the King of England quite prominently. He was mm -hmm. in a dispute with the Pope mm -hmm. in 1533 and broke with the Catholic Church. And of course, the 77, you know, 1777 was the flip side. The colonies broke with the King of England. And just notice the coronation of King Charles coming up in May during the one of the kind of big historical events of the initial ingress. And again, he's in another dispute, this time with his own son, who's broken off from the monarchy. I don't know why that's related to Pluto and Aquarius, but it keeps coming up. So I thought it was interesting. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so let's move on to April. Here is the calendar again, just to show some of the early ingresses. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that's going to come up over and over again this month is now that Pluto's in Aquari at zero degrees of Aquarius and Saturn is in the early degrees of Pisces, every time like an inner planet changes signs this month, it's going to hit a hard aspect with um, one of those two outer planets. And that's going to give us some of our first previews of what those <laughs> outer planets really do in those signs. So here's a graph from Archetypal Explorer where it shows, for example, on um, on Monday the 3rd, for example, Mercury will square Pluto. So that'll be an activation of Pluto. Then later in the month, around the, the, ninth, the 10th and 11th, Venus will try in Pluto, um, then Venus will square Saturn on the 13th, the Sun will square Pluto around the 19th and 20th, and so on and so forth. So that's something I think everybody should pay attention to, even though those are somewhat minor or normally like passing aspects that we maybe wouldn't dwell on, um, they might have added importance this month just because it's the first time of many times that some of those transits are going to take place in the case of Saturn over the next three years, or in the case of Pluto over the next 20 years. Yeah, I mean, those matter. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you want to talk about them now or in order, but, you know, um, especially for planets in Gemini, right, which usually are get to go fast and play. Um, and, you know, uh, have experience a measure of freedom immediately hitting a square to Saturn is, you know, a heavy waterlogged Saturn in Pisces is definitely not going to be, you know, it's not going to allow for that like light, swift, playful 
energy to thrive very easily. Right, for sure. All right, so for the people watching the video version, I'm going to put the chart of the moment up for April 1st. So this is what we start with at the beginning of the month. One of the most notable things, of course, that we talked about in last month's forecast is that by the end of March, Mars will have departed from its eight-month transit, eight or nine-month transit through Gemini that it started last August, and it will have finally moved into Cancer. Um, after that very, very long Mars retrograde period in Gemini that we've been experiencing over the past several months. So that's one of the other distinctly different things that we're experiencing already at the beginning of April. Yeah, and it just makes the, like, that's the third ingress within a few weeks. Um, and just really, I think, accentuate, accentuates the energy shift that we're going through in March and April. Yeah, for sure. Of new beginnings, of old things ending, ending, especially some of the old challenges that the Mars retrograde brought finally being wrapped up. And then by this point in early April, April firmly heading into uncharted territory. I mean, ingresses, like ingresses, you know, they tend to be kind of chaotic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that, especially at zero degrees, when it changes from 29 to zero degrees, I mean, mostly outer planets, but when you get all of these changes simultaneously, it's like, it's like the old era isn't quite over, you know, it's like when you move into a new house, but all your stuff is still in boxes, right? It's like, it's very chaotic. It has that feeling of like, you've stepped into the new era, but it, it hasn't really, at the same time, it hasn't really begun yet. So you're in the in-between zone. And I think that creates a lot of chaos and uncertainty. Mm. Right. So yeah, definitely. And and also um just with uh planets in cardinal signs, cardinal signs also have that that quality of beginning of setting things in motion, but you know, you just kind of see the the motion but not necessarily the trajectory or impacts yet. Yeah, so here on April 3rd, we get our first actual ingress of the month, aside from already starting with Mars having moved to Cancer, but Mercury changes signs and moves from Aries into Taurus, where it immediately squares Pluto. Um, what are some of our keywords? We've talked a lot about Mercury, hard Mercury-Pluto aspects over the past several months, because especially, or a couple of years actually, because there's been some notable stations where Mercury has stationed retrograde or direct in a hard aspect with Pluto. And we kept coming up with, um, or we kept observing at the time, um, like exposés or or things that were like buried or hidden being sort of brought up or dug up um, at different points. So that seems to be one of the core themes of Mercury-Pluto. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, it, Mercury, has a, Mercury has a rough um, was it row to hoe here. Um, because we've got the square with Pluto, and then we've got a conjunction with the dragon's head, and then on to Uranus, and Venus will be leaving Taurus before long, which, you know, in Venus's time, co-presence with Mercury there helps stabilize things, um, but Venus is soon gone, and, you know, it, especially if we're looking at that first decan of Taurus, you know, usually with Mercury there, which is the ruler, um, we're looking at trying to make plans um, like the, the archetype is like thinking about what do I plant this year? Um, and so if I'm going to plant, you know, I don't know, soybeans, uh, or tomatoes, like I need, you know, I need to do that. I need this kind of soil. I need to prepare this way. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to buy this many seeds. And so Mercury and Taurus has this like planning for the future, um, for the future harvest sort of quality. And it's very, very difficult to plan here, right? Uh, square Pluto conjunct uh, in a, an eclipse point with, you know, coming up on a conjunction with Uranus. Um, and, you know, I think that that's relevant on a personal level, but that also pings a lot of the discussion we were having uh, about finances, right? Like, how do I plan? Mm -hmm. what do I, where do I plant my coins? Yeah, and that's going to become more important because we're we're heading into a Mercury retrograde later in the month where Mercury is going to slow down and station retrograde conjunct Uranus. Yeah. So Mercury Uranus is going to be one of the themes of this month, especially in the second half of April and the early part of May. But it's striking that it just opens with that square with Pluto. Well, Mercury, um, so Mercury, you know, Mercury and Taurus is like, like slow plotting methodical kind of approach to things or Taurus has the effect of like, 
kind of slowing things down in general. And then Mercury is actually going to be slowing down physically as it approaches its its station retrograde. So I think there's some there's some theme here of like slowing everything down and you know really being very methodical about what you're doing. Hmm. Yeah, and that's um that's a I I think in a lot of ways that's a good default response to uh to a confusing situation if you're Mercury is like okay slow down there's a lot here that's obscured right Pluto obscures uh the north node obscures um Uranus brings changes out of nowhere which means you can't see the source or you didn't see them coming right there's a lot that's that's difficult to um there are a lot of relevant factors here for Mercury um that are very difficult to see and get information on clearly and that may yeah. that may relate to the banking crisis uh, Taurus is certainly related to banking and money the square to Pluto um maybe another trigger in some way or yeah I mean Mercury you know is Mercury could almost stand in for capital here right like oh do I go here right. do I go there I don't know is uh, you know there's there's dragons and uh <laughs> uh and death gods and Uranus <laughs> and I don't want to I'm not sure if I want to put my money in any of these places yeah and Mercury um Mercury Pluto aspect oh, and just... and there's a sextile to Saturn right so we get another malefic just you know it's a sextile but joining the party sorry Chris yeah it's sextiling both Saturn and Mars a few days later um so just themes of like control and manipulation when it comes to communication and other mercurial mm. activities or things to kind of watch mm. out for that day um and it'll be interesting mm. just pay, paying attention to the shift of that energy just because over the past decade we're used to having it happen in cardinal signs but now all of a sudden it's happening in fixed signs so there's greater themes of um like Robert was saying of of things that are slow or things that are dug in or that take um, a long time to build up but become very permanent and become very intractable and what happens when you have something intractable but when mm. there's also themes of like control or tension there at the same time all right so that's well, what we're kind of one of the things we haven't really mentioned with Pluto and Aquarius is like ideological this kind of fixed ideological battles and the camps really polarizing into these fixed sides um I don't know with Mercury there could be something there like um some type of ideological power struggle I'm yeah there. so that makes sense to me on a like interpretive symbolic level but uh on a lived level it's like hasn't that just been years and years and years <laughs> and years like uh do I rem I can barely remember a time before that it's but it's yeah. getting it gets more and more extreme right um every year yeah, yeah so I guess, far yeah we'll see what was the astrologers associate like Pluto and Aquarius the last time with like the French Revolution and things like that right mm -hmm. yeah that definitely happened okay well <laughs> not the ingress but the the transit at the end yeah. it was the end of the transit it'll be interesting seeing what the parallel is for that in modern times then and and what what would have that level of um extremeness from the perspective of whatever it is that we're currently taking for granted societally or that some country or society is taking for granted and what would be such a radical shift in power um that would represent that in our time I think will be one of the interesting things with Pluto and Aquarius over the next two decades um all right so let's talk about our first lunation of the month which is this full moon that's taking place in the sign of Libra um on the 5th of April so there it is it's at 15 16 degrees of Libra um this is when the Sun Jupiter conjunction is coming up but it's not quite there Jupiter is at 20 degrees of Aries and the Sun is at 16 degrees of Aries the moon is coming off of a square with Mars um, which is one of the downsides of Mars shifting into a cardinal sign is now the cardinal signs have a bit more tension and a bit more conflict due to those hard aspects with Mars um let's see what else is going on here that's really notable configuration wise about this lunation there's actually a Chiron Kazemi um I don't know if you 
you guys don't use Chiron too much, but in this particular luca lunation, um, I think it is an interesting factor uh, to include. Okay, there it is. So Chiron's at 15 degrees of Aries. So yeah, it's very closely configured with the sun and the moon. That's interesting. The um, yeah. Uh, so Chiron's been really, you know, Chiron's been really featured in March. We didn't talk much about that because there was all this other stuff going on. But Jupiter was conjunct Chiron during the banking crisis as well, and Jupiter, being a prosperity, luck, confidence planet, maybe was injured or damaged or weakened somehow, or expanded the Chiron themes of a wounding. Um, and so that might be also continuing uh, on this lunation, something that I've been thinking about. That's interesting. So what I focus on with this lunation is that, you know, as with every other full moon, we have the, the moon and the sign opposite to the sun. And so there's, uh, there's always a sort of, there's always an emphasis on counterpointing or checking or balancing whatever the solar focus is right and you know with aries right we have um a, a, a quick accelerative sometimes explosive like um kinetic movement uh for a, a racing forward uh or <laughs> and forward not necessarily like progress but just like in that direction um whereas with libra right you know we we literally have the sign of the scales um, the whole modus operandi is to attempt to balance anything, which looks like contrarity, right? The idea is like, okay, so everything's moving. So how do we, how do we, how do we balance all of this out? How do we slow things down? Um, because we're moving, uh, because some things are moving so fast, which I think is echoed additionally by Venus being Venus, the ruler of the the moon here, being in Taurus, right, and having come off of the conjunction with. Uh, uh, destabilizing Uranus, right? So I think this moon is going to try really hard um, to stabilize things um, with, you know, medium success. Right. What is it applying to? Is it applying to anything? No, it's, it's applying like to Jupiter. Okay, that's that's good. But it's a combust Jupiter. Right. Yeah, that's a really key. So that's something I've been talking about a lot um, with my uh, followers and subscribers uh, for financial astrology. Jupiter is practice pretty much combust for almost the entire month of April. This I think is a bit worrisome. Um, of course you get the Kazemi for about 72 hours, which happens a, 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 the week following this, but this full moon does kind of spotlight the Jupiter combustion. And it's just another, um, you know, something that I'm going to talk about for April is like a, a crisis of confidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with when we get to the eclipse, uh, when Mars is in fall for the entire month, uh, which can weaken confidence, Jupiter combusts. These are all confidence planets. Mm -hmm. Confidence in the system um, may be a problem, whether it's the banking system, I'm not sure, of course. But uh, and the eclipse in Aries, usually exalted, the sun is going to be also eclipsed. So, um we got a lot of factors here that could could be a could continue this crisis. Yeah, well, I like the I like that um, that focus on Jupiter as a planet that provides confidence. Um, it's sort of oh well, this is something that we can believe in, or this is something that reassures and stabilizes all of which Jupiter does, um, and th that seems to resonate with Mercury's situation, not knowing you know, where to farm <laughs> or like where to plant the seeds. And then, you know, the full moon is looking to Jupiter. It's applying aspect is to Jupiter, like for reassurance. Um, but Jupiter's in a position where it can't provide confidence now. Right. And the, that, um, that burning or combustion of Jupiter is, you know, it's not a long-term thing, right? Like maybe max 30 days, but really we're probably looking at about, you know, a week and a half or a week on each side, maybe. A for bit longer. whole combustion yeah okay depending on orbs right between 30 days yeah. and two weeks um and you know the we have like jupiter's role is reassuring um which uh certainly uh overlaps with certain monetary institutions but like oh we're gonna do this and everybody says oh, okay well then it won't be so bad and you were just saying robert that people have been have felt um profoundly not assured by some of the official statements 
Um, that sounds like because Jupiter's um, <laughs> uh, Jupiter's going into combustion now. It is. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you know, combustion is like an astronomical thing, you know, which is always interesting, right? Because it's like, can you see it? Yeah. Where's um, Jupiter? Yeah. And if you can't see it, uh, you can't feel it, right? That's the that's the ancient, uh, you know, astrology on combustion. It's like if the light isn't visible, then the effect of the planet is really diminished. And there's like a protective effect of Jupiter uh, mm -hmm. that we, we don't always talk about, you know, good luck, good fortune, prosperity, optimism, hope, faith, confidence is a Jup Jupiterian qualities that may be diminished in April, especially as it gets into the maximum combustion. And one thing I've observed over the years is like markets do not like combustion. And even just mercury combust, uh, you know, was was touch and go there for a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't sure if the whole system was going to come down. So it's going to be really interesting to see that April 10th, first through the 10th period as, as Jupiter uh, goes into that maximum combustion. One of and the then it will Kazemi that... and everybody will be like, oh, sa sa we're saved <laughs> for a few right. days. One of the things that happens also with planets under the beams is sometimes it just means things that happen that are not apparent, apparent or things happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's that some of the efforts in order to balance the scales or to um, shore things up or provide confidence or just things that are happening behind the scenes that are not immediately apparent, even if there's something positive that's going on or some positive attempts that are being made. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely going to be multiple ways to look at it, um, but hidden, yeah, some hidden behind the scenes. I, I like that. I like that interpretation. Right. But yes, but yeah, so the moon's going to try to balance things with probably mixed results. Um, it probably looks better nice. results for individuals than for, um, you know, uh, uh, empires. Well, certainly like on a more personal level, it will bring up kind of relationship issues maybe, right? With Libra, um, just interpersonal relationship issues. I mean, it's ruled by Venus, which has dignity and Taurus. It's kind of a nice vibe to it. It might, um, you know, uh, there, there's on the surface, it looks good. Yeah. And I would say, I would just point out that that middle deck end of, uh, of Libra really has uh, contracts and deals. Um, as its focal mm. point. It's really about the deal, which stabilizes things, in, which includes marriage, right? But it's mm. like, it's like, no, we're going to have this relationship and that stabilizes things. Mm. Okay. Um, all right. So that is our first lunation of the month. And just a few days later, we get the Sun-Jupiter conjunction or the Kazemi that you guys were talking about around 21, 22 degrees of Aries. Right. There is still something to believe in. Right. There is yeah. still something to uh, to be excited about. Right. Yeah. The sun conjoining the greater benefic in the sign of its exaltation and um, renewing the cycle with the synodic cycle between the sun and the Jupiter and Jupiter for another year. Um, yeah. And that that's one of the more positive aspects of this month um, and is similar to, or at least Lisa and I focused our auspicious elections this month, largely on Leo rising elections, um, taking advantage of that sun Jupiter conjunction. And that actually might be a good time to mention it. Uh, cause I believe that is actually our auspicious election for the month. So this month we went for an election around, I think, um, April 10th, 2023, around two o'clock or let's say 2 10 or so p.m uh local time so what you'll end up with is a chart with leo rising and the ruler of the ascendant is the sun in the ninth whole sign house exalted and applying to conjunction with jupiter in a day chart which is probably one of the most positive mm -hmm. um, situations you can get when it comes to the sun and the ruler of the ascendant in a day chart and in a good house uh, we also have the moon in Sagittarius in the fifth house and in another fire sign applying to a trine with the sun and Jupiter. And Jupiter has um, a little bit of reception because it's in Jupiter's domicile, even though it's not applying directly. Um, other things going on in this chart, we have Venus later in Taurus, the very end of Taurus. There's some other Leo rising charts earlier in the month where you can get Venus in an earlier degree, but this is sort of like the last bit of Venus and Taurus in the 10th whole sign house, and it's up there with Mercury and Uranus. 
um, all in Taurus. So it's not a terrible chart for 10th house or 9th house activities. 9th house activities can th be things like education, travel, um, publishing, learning, like signing up for a course or something like that. And 10th house things can be, especially with Venus, things related to art or creativity um, and other related related themes. With the moon in the fifth house, it may also be a good chart just for like fun and games and leisurely activities in general. Uh, what other types of things would you guys use ninth house elections for? Yeah, long distance journeys overseas, long trips. Mm. Yeah, so that is our auspicious election for the month. So that's on April 10th. Uh, we found, I believe, three or four other electional charts for this month. Um, which we released just a few days ago on our Auspicious Elections podcast, um, which you can find out more information about at theastrologypodcast.com slash elections. All right. So I like that Sun-Jupiter conjunction. It has a feeling of like optimism, of growth, expansion, hope. It's also taking place in the sign of the sun's exaltation. And themes surrounding exaltation are just doing something but doing the best version of that that you can or sort of raising things up to the highest level that you possibly can and these themes of excelling or of excellence like what does mm -hmm. it mean to achieve excellence in some specific sphere of activity or some specific domain of activity um, we all know what it's like to do something or to learn something but it's quite different to do some do like the best version of that thing that you possibly can um, so that's a theme, I think, to think about, especially around the time of that Sun-Jupiter conjunction is those themes of excellence and of excelling at something. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, exalted planets have extremely high standards, right? That not only is the action uh, effective, um, but exalted planets also tend to be pretty efficient. They want excellent results without a massive expenditure of energy. Uh, exalted planets wouldn't be caught dead being tryhards, right? Mm. Um, there, there's like there's two sides to it. Hmm. Um, it's and one one more thing about that is because it's um you know because we're coming into the that Kazemi, um that moment of the beginning end of Jupiter's cycle. You know the thing to, you know the point of growth or learning or success. You know the Jupiter thing um, is going to be. In a, in a nascent form, right? It's getting the idea that becomes the thing, right? It's not the point where there's been a whole cycle. There's been plenty of time to, to work and grow and blah, blah, blah. Like it's the, it's that, it's the seed point, right? It's the like, aha, that's it. Like that's the, that's the point to move forward from. And it's also worth noting as we're talking about um, combustion, um and related dynamics the sun isn't hurt by combustion the sun doesn't mind um you know devouring <laughs> all of jupiter by flame uh, with teeth of fire um and so you know what is it what is exalted sunning right it's you know um for people who are in leadership positions it's being an excellent leader right um for the rest of us it's you know it's it's self-governance right it's being autonomous and acting not reacting you know governing your own governing your soul governing your life being responsible um and responsive um and having a vision it's kind of a spectacular kazemi really because the sun is exalted and then jupiter is kazemi is going to have basically kind of like dignity as well so uh if it wasn't for the eclipse i would say that would be a massive favorable and huge turning point um into something positive um right Right. Good as an election, but um, <laughs> next week, <laughs> next week on, yeah, the days of our lives. The yeah. Weeks I mean, that lives. week will be great. Yeah. That, 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 that is a yeah. spectacular. And um, the sun does benefit from the conjunction to Jupiter. Uh, as you said, Jupiter doesn't benefit as much from the conjunction to the sun until it hits exact. Yeah. Much better for solar things like, you know, like Chris gave the, the chart, a, a Leo rising. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So related to that, before we get to next week, um, on the same day that we're getting the Sun-Jupiter conjunction on April 11th, 
Um, Venus also makes an ingress and departs from Taurus and moves into Gemini, where it immediately trines Pluto. So this is one of those other ingresses I was talking about where we have um, these new aspects to kind of contend with that are a little bit different than what we're used to, where Venus goes in and makes a relatively positive aspect or the most positive aspect of Pluto, and we get a trine between two air signs. Although then not too long, just a couple of days later, Venus hits the other outer planet that is now early in the signs, which is a square to Saturn at three degrees of Pisces. Um, and that aspect completes, uh, it looks like on the 13th and 14th of April. So and that um, leads into the eclipse. That's kind of the really the last aspect before the eclipse is Venus's square to Saturn. Yeah. So why don't we talk about that just briefly to get, just give people, especially novices, some delineations of first, like what kind of keywords could we come up for Venus trine Pluto into air signs in Gemini and Aquarius? Um, I know the hard aspects between Venus and Pluto are usually a bit more difficult for relationships, but here we're talking about um, a positive aspect or a flowing aspect, uh, which I, in air signs, I would conceptualize as like flowing communication um, that can deepen the intensity of like a relationship between two people as one delineation. I think I would posit, I would probably give for that. Um, what other things spring to mind for each of you? Okay. Yeah, I like that depth of communication through an air sign. I yeah. the, what, what sprang immediately to mind for Venus and Gemini trying Pluto and Aquarius is, oh, our new robot overlords are kind of fun. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're doing, <laughs> they're doing poetry. You can get it to do like poetry for uh, different things. I sent, uh, I did that for, yeah, I did that with the, you know, the <laughs> astrology delineation back in December, put it in the form of a poem, but I know other people are experimenting with like sending people poems and stuff as well. Yeah, well, and this one moves almost immediately into the square with Saturn because Pluto is so early in Aquarius that there's no like lead up where Venus is applying to Pluto for more than, you know, I don't know, half a day, quarter of a day. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's like, okay, robot overlords are kind of fun, immediately uh, applying to the square with Saturn. And that's depressing. That's yeah. kind of a bummer. That's kind of heavy. Oh, that's the implications. Even trines to Pluto can be a little heavy sometimes too. Um, they, yeah. you know, uh, it's not always fun in, fun in games, even in the trine, but it, it's like could bring a transformative like event that deepens intimacy or connection. But you might have to get through something difficult to get right. there. Someone someone tells you um, a horrible dark secret about themselves in a really entertaining <laughs> manner, and now you know them better, and you have to figure out what to do with that. <laughs> exactly sums it up or or alternatively it's almost like like communication is increased with venus going into gemini and it can be somewhat deep or or striking or probing communication with the trine to pluto um but then there's something that where there's still a barrier almost on like a soul level where venus walks into or runs into that square with saturn and venus saturn squares are often a feeling of distance or of boundaries to, between two people that are are holding people apart or keeping them apart or adding some sort of um uh difficulty or surmountable difficulty in a relationship that either stops it from happening or alternatively that just makes it so that there's something extra you have to do if you want to maintain this relationship with somebody and figuring out how to navigate the mm. boundaries of that is usually the challenge yeah um you know, like what you said, Chris, uh, with Venus Saturn, you often have stuck on the outside, right, where the boundaries don't allow for enmeshment. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, you often have with Venus Saturn, oh, we're both stuck in this thing, like this thing that has grown up between us and around us. And, you know, it's very um, like relationship architecture um, is, you know, looking at, oh, so this is the space that, you know, this is the like, this is the space that the sum of our interactions and agreements and disagreements and promises, et cetera, like has created. And we're both inside it and can't leave. Right. Saturn like locks the door, either mm -hmm. locks you out or locks you in, or at least that's the feeling. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. 
This could have a lot to do with intimacy too, you know, like, um, like Venus trying Pluto is the promise of a kind of deepening into intimacy, but then the, the square to Saturn is the, there's a fear of that connection. There's a fear of getting close to someone. There's a fear of intimacy. So, uh, and maybe those two things could be related in some way. That's a great point. That's really good. Um, yeah, so this whole... also could be a rough day for the markets that day uh, or that week uh, with that. Um, well, that Venus square Saturn. Um, uh, yeah, leading well, into the eclipse. Yeah, well, and with Mercury ruling that Venus, they're actually mutual reception. Um, but, you know, Mercury's Mercury's doing some rough stuff. Mercury's um, right in the middle of the Uranus, Neptune, or excuse me, Uranus uh north node mix and is come getting close to the retrograde right so yeah. venus like saying hey mercury what should i be excited about and mercury's like i don't know <laughs> i don't know where yeah. to go mercury is slow at this point it's moving slower than its average daily motion by mid-april and it's only seven days away from stationing retrograde um let me see. oh that's actually the turning point it was right around that time if you look at the retrogrades and stations um, table at the bottom right, it looks like it switches around April 10th or 11th. Mercury um, switches from being faster than its average daily motion to slower than its average daily motion. Hmm. So themes of Mercury and communication and other related things starting to slow down um, or grind to a halt eventually or just taking longer um, are going to start to increase from that point forward. Yeah, Mercury is sort of like slowly tiptoeing towards Uranus, um, being like, I don't want to conjunct Uranus, right? And then we'll later in the month turn retrograde before conjoining Uranus, um, but like right at the doorstep. And so, the, yeah, the Venus's ruler also isn't in great shape there. One thing to mention here, did you both notice, and I saw a lot of people noticing, and I kind of noticed, like there's a different vibe ever since saturn went into pisces it's no longer an aquarius for the first time in three years and suddenly the fixed signs all feel a lot lighter especially when the moon is transiting through those signs you're not getting those hard aspects like when the moon goes through scorpio or when the moon goes through aquarius um and that's something i'm noticing here that we're going to have another repetition of that of just the moon moving through scorpio and aquarius without the hard aspects from saturn for the first time in three years which is kind of a nice um, uplifting, but also much different vibe than what we've been experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. After my first um, sort of catching myself vibing with the Saturn shift was the increased heaviness in one area. But over the next week, there were, there were just, there were these little moments where I would go to attend to something that was a habitual source of anxiety or stress, and it mm-hmm. would just feel lighter. I was like, oh, I don't need to worry about that anymore or why why did i get into a pattern of worrying about that i was like oh saturn's not there anymore it's over there it's it's the barnacle now it's not the (laughs) you know whatever whatever it was in aquarius right the airborne uh like virus (laughs) yeah um well that's something go ahead go ahead no no go ahead all right all right so um yeah because that was something i was just noticing here around the 15th and 16th just because the moon will go through Mm -hmm. aquarius but then it'll go into pisces and conjoin saturn around that time that venus is coming off of that square so it's going to emphasize Mm -hmm. some of those themes Mm -hmm. by the moon sort of swooping in and conjoining saturn around the same time all right yeah yeah, this this mid-month is very complicated and increasingly so Right, because we've got that the complications of the Venus ingress, the complications of Mercury not in a great position, and then slowing into the retrograde, and then the solar eclipse is right around the corner. Also, you know, um, uh, middle of the month, late middle. Yeah, it's all just building up to that eclipse. And... You might want to just mention too that April, I believe it's April fifth or sixth, that Mercury enters its shadow. And so we might already start to feel some of the issues coming up for that Mercury retrograde. Yeah, it's all kind of headed towards the eclipse. What's the direct station degree? Direct station? What what degree is the shadow start at? Like is oh, it five two degrees. or three? Oh, I five. think it was okay. five. Yeah. Which is interesting because the Jupiter will make the exact same retrograde 
by degrees from 15 tourists to five tourists we'll make the same stations later in the year i don't know how common that is but it, it's kind of interesting yeah, well okay. it's also interesting that when mercury um backs all the way up into taurus jupiter will be uh, about to arrive or have just arrived in taurus yeah so and mercury is going to oh. go retrograde like two days after the eclipse yeah it's so that <laughs> period there is fraught yeah it's interesting right the with the kazemi right like that's that's more of a like longer term thing like get the vision of the good or the you know the thing that can um improve triumph etc cetera, etc cetera. but don't expect like now things are great right mercury is still or excuse me jupiter is still combust we've got mercury issues we've got venus issues we've got eclipse issues right like the the jupiter the jupiter kazemi is not now things are fine right it's like actually the next couple of weeks are pretty fucking crazy <laughs> At least Jupiter will be gaining strength. Um, so we've mm -hmm. got something positive to we can say in the it will, you know, a lot of times it will go Kazemi and it will feel like this fe feeling of euphoria, and then it will drop back into combustion only to realize yeah. that the crisis has not been resolved. Um, and uh so it'll be interesting, but at least it will be gaining strength after the conjunction. All right, let's get into our primary thing that we just we keep tiptoeing into which is this <laughs> this eclipse at 29 degrees of aries on uh it looks like either late on the 19th or early on the 20th depending on your time zone so this is um not just a new moon when the sun and moon meet up but it's actually one of our four eclipses that are taking place this year in 2023 so eclipse season officially begins April 20th with this eclipse in Aries, and then we get another lunar eclipse on May 5th on uh, at the at 14 degrees of Scorpio. So because the nodes are getting ready to change signs or the nodes are changing signs, the eclipses now are starting to straddle the um, Aries Libra and the Scorpio Taurus axis. Um, and this is the very first set of eclipses that's going to be starting to take place in the Aries Libra axis so it's notable as another set of shifts because we've been having Scorpio Taurus over the past year or so now year or two now all right so this eclipse um one of the major aspects to it uh, again because it's so close to that border of Aries and Taurus it's right at 29 is it's actually squaring Pluto like really closely and immediately after the eclipse takes place, the moon will immediately ingress into Taurus and then square Pluto at zero degrees of Aquarius. And the sun will do something similar just hours later when the sun ingresses into uh, Taurus and then squares Pluto. So again, we just have that theme of really activating and really starting to understand what that Pluto ingress into Aquarius is all about and what larger societal implications it may have for large groups of people since it's going to be moving through the same sign for the next 20 years so it's going to have this long-term generational sort of influence um, but we're going to get really close and intimate with it here by having an eclipse squaring it at this point in in the month well, thank God the eclipses are not conjunct Jupiter, uh, conjunct Uranus anymore, because I think that was just extremely chaotic and turbulent. Um, trying to put we, something. We, we got positive. one more. We, we got do, one more, but yeah, not on it. It's opposing it, but not con directly conjunct. No, well, so. we have one more in Taurus in the fall. Is it conjunct Uranus? It's in the same sign. Okay. All right. So I take that back. But yeah, like almost done. <laughs> All right, we're almost done. Right. First yeah. eclipse in air, first North Node eclipse in Aries in 18 years, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just about like eclipses in Aries, right? Because this is an eclipse in Aries. You know, the eclipses always have, um, you know, the, the eclipses uh, always have this sort of Game of Thrones, Dance of Dragons, um, like, con like shady contestation of seats of power. That's been an eclipse thing forever, right? Um, hide the king, there's going to be an eclipse, right? Or kill the king, 
uh, plan to kill the king when there's an eclipse, right? And there, it's always this like, you know, this jo this draconic jostling um, and fighting over power. And that's really uh, doubly emphasized with uh, a solar eclipse in the sign of the sun's exaltation, like we were just talking about, mm -hmm. right? And so the fighting for high position, the people falling from high position, you know, it occurs to me that when one person falls from a high position, now there's a power vacuum, right? And that means that means the the dragons come out to see who's you know who gets to who gets to, uh, who gets to claim the uh, the vacant throne. Um, yeah, that was a real and, theme during the last one in uh, late October and early November. Is like uh, Kanye West had that whole fall that really coincided with I think the Scorpio eclipse and and fell in much of the public's eyes for just some of the things that he was doing at the time. It was a really notable fall of a public figure. Um, and around the same time, we also had Elon Musk taking over Twitter during that time, although that was kind of tied in with some of the broader themes of the Mars retrograde in Gemini as well. Yeah, definitely. And also very like Taurus, like who who gets to be, you know, uh, Kanye, you're no longer a king of art right? Or uh, Elon, now you're the, you know, you're the king of the Twitter thing. Whereas um, the, um, when we're, when we're looking at Aries, we, it's less um, sort of king or queen of a thing. It's more like actual positions of power, like, like leadership itself. Um, and, and, and then I, as like one to side your point, go ahead. And to your point, because actually just to reinforce what you just said also for them, it was also majorly a financial thing. It was like Kanye lost the Adidas deal and went from being worth like a billion or two billion dollars to not and then um similarly with elon musk it was like he was kind of forced into the twitter deal which was just like a huge mm -hmm. expense um and so financially there was a real threat of of a financial loss so just to reinforce your point about the scorpio taurus axis eclipses right. versus this shift we're we're moving into yeah thank you uh, and just one one note i wanted to make um if we look at um, lunar mansions, either Vedic or Arabic, that first, um, that first mansion, uh, which, uh, which this occurred, which this eclipse occurs within, um, is explicitly associated with medicine. And so I wonder if there will be something with medical authorities, um, that this eclipse is associated with. Wait, what's associated with medicine? Uh, the, the, the mansion, the lunar mansion or nakshatra, uh, and nakshatra that this eclipse occurs within. Um, and I, I note that because we had an eclipse um, on uh, on the star Russell Hogg, which is the star of Asclepius, the medicine star, when the vac right when the vaccines started getting administered in the United States. And so some of these, you know, some of these these parts of the the sky that are associated with medicine, when there's something as big as an eclipse on them, we would we should assume that there will be something uh, visibly medical there. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, Austin, going to your touching on your theme of like Game of Thrones, um, this eclipse is conjunct uh, President Biden's moon, which is at zero Taurus. So it's out of sign, oh. but it's very, very close, very, very close to his moon. Um, so he may be affected, may keep well, an eye the, on. And so he's getting the Pluto square. Yeah, the Pluto square. I knew he's it was getting in the, Taurus. I didn't realize yeah. it was at zero Taurus. Z I believe it's at zero Taurus. I scanned through a couple of charts when I was uh, prepping for the uh, podcast today. Uh, so uh, yeah, he may be he may be affected. Um, hmm. Here it is. So it's at zero. It depends on the time because we've got a rounded time of eight thirty. But yeah, it's at zero fifty nine at eight thirty Taurus. So one way or another, um, Pluto. Now that it's at zero Aquarius, is like squaring that, and the eclipse itself will be at twenty nine Aries, pretty close to that. Yeah, so, you know, Chris, I just want to uh, remember with you briefly when we were doing the yearly and we, you know, we we kind of started out with this idea of like, oh, this is going to be better for the fixed signs. They stopped getting nuked by eclipses and Saturn and Uranus and all that's true. But we kept discovering these moments where right. it's like, well, it's going to kind of hit the fixed signs, too. It's like, oh, it's not an eclipse and a fixed sign until four hours later when yeah. that same energy gets carried in. It's It's this sort of. I don't know. It, it may, it's this like slightly extended torture of the fixed signs. It was more wishful thinking, I think, on my part as a fixed sign heavy person that we were we're out of it. But yeah, you're right. We've got 
the eclipse series is not finished this ingress of pluto into aquarius is bringing like way different dynamics that are going to keep getting activated for a good chunk of the year while pluto is in aquarius before it goes back into capricorn so yeah there's still a lot to go around and we had talked about to your point also just advances and changes in technology and how that may affect human biology and the mm -hmm. application because that's another area actually that companies are scrambling all over themselves to apply ai is to biological questions like developing new drugs and things like that and of course i always think about famously in 2020 when i think about the zero degree of aquarius axis how um you know it, part of the lockdowns that occurred in like March and April of 2023 years ago were around that Mars Saturn conjunction at zero Aquarius mm -hmm. and then later in the year in December we got the public release of the vaccine when Jupiter and Saturn met up at zero Aquarius mm -hmm. so with Pluto moving there to zero Aquarius um that is kind of interesting just themes of um humans developing uh, attempting to develop technologies in order to fix biological things as one of the things that we talked about in about Pluto and Aquarius over the next 20 years. Yeah, definitely. definitely. I mean, one of the ways to look at this eclipse is that it's really activating the Pluto in Aquarius and it's not in a gentle way. Um, and you know, there's man there, I mean, there's so much to talk about with this eclipse too. I mean, um, uh, it's going to square the USA Sibley Pluto. Um, oh, and at the yeah. same time, Mars is going to be on the Sibley sun on the same day and mars is the ruler of the eclipse so um this this one has you know a lot of crisis uh potential of course we can't know for sure what's going to happen but we can identify high probability alignments for a crisis to take place this one mm -hmm. has all of the things that we would look for a square to pluto can bring a crisis a breakdown uh, uh eclipses themselves can be a trigger we talked about last year, the eclipses were conjunct Uranus or opposing Uranus and squaring Saturn. So they were either forming the square or the T-square to the Uranus-Saturn aspect. Well, this time, the new dynamic, it's conjunct Jupiter and square Pluto. So one thing that's doing is it's really emphasizing this upcoming Jupiter-Pluto square that's still out of sign at the time of the eclipse, but it is approaching. Um, and that has a lot of ramifications, I think, uh, for what's going on politically and in the financial world. Yeah. Well, yeah. And one, one thing I just want to note is that it, it is the first eclipse in a new sign in quite in, in a, a while. And so um, if, you know, crisis isn't the wrong word, but, um, you know, it, it, when we think of crisis, we think of a lot of the things that we're already aware of. Like this is this is um, that eclipse energy moving into a new sector, and it looks like it impacts some things, some of the fixed stuff that we're familiar with, but its source point is over in a different sign. True. That yeah, I mean, I do worry it's about the um, the the extent to which eclipses in the past year or two have been tied in with major financial stuff happening, especially in the U.S. And I do expect some major financial movements up or down during this eclipse season because that's the thing we've seen in almost every eclipse season for the past year or two has been great instability and sudden changes of things moving up or down both in individual people's lives and individuals rising and falling um, because eclipses represent great beginnings and great endings but also um, much larger things in terms of the markets or in terms of the country or, or things like that yeah well and I'm, I'm let me just say that like you know if we're looking for things to stabilize um you know <laughs> things don't really stabilize even in like a you know meaningful medium term level um until we get mercury direct and probably jupiter visible and back and then ingressing into taurus right like you know if we're looking for stability and reassurance um you know we don't <clears throat> we don't get that until end of the month or beginning of next month um like this all takes a while yeah well, we should mention that because well we've got the eclipse and that square pluto that the other component that's happening almost exactly at the same time is that mercury retrograde station that literally stations only a day or two later very closely conjunct uranus um so why don't we generate some keywords here for mercury stationing retrograde and taurus conjunct uranus 
I mean, Mercury retrogrades themselves are delays, difficulties, things taking longer. Um, I remember famously there was a Mercury retrograde station during the last election when there were delays counting up the votes, for example, um, but that was square, square Saturn. Um, but when it's conjunct Uranus, oftentimes the technological snafus and the things coming out of complete left field that destabilize something, um, when that combines when, with a Mercury retrograde, you usually get more that end of the Mercury retrograde archetype. Yeah, I yeah, mean, I mean, you can get travel, uh, you know, you can get some serious, like we saw with those train derailments, a sudden mm -hmm. type of travel related accidents or shipping um, of stuff like that. Yeah, that um, Mercury helps the trains run on time, especially in Taurus. And so, you know, if we're looking at like the delivery of goods and peoples um, in a prompt and orderly manner, we're looking at the disruption of that. You know, Uranus brings a lot of, I would say, just chaos energy to Mercury. Um, you also may have, um, you know, Mercury, Mercury makes lots of small decisions um and um moving into that like slowing into that almost conjunction with uranus it could be you know one one uh storyline will probably play out is oh i need to make a decision about this or i was going to do this at this time but now this whole thing that i wasn't expecting uranus has happened so i, I can't make that decision until this resolves itself yeah i have to back up from it and go back and you know or, or it's just some... communication disruption like yeah, like some technological snafu forces you to have to go back and review something or revise something or do something over again um, because things got kind of like out of whack. Yeah, it could be larger things like a massive hacking attack, um, some kind of bigger political themes. So this whole thing is kind of really because the mercury retrograde coincides pretty well with the eclipses like you were saying austin it's really um centralized in the la later part the last half essentially of april the last week or two of april and the first couple of weeks of may because it looks like the sun mercury conjunction which is the halfway point in the retrograde cycle occurs on may 1st so that's when we're halfway through the retrograde and there starts to be some turnaround where you start to see some resolution or at least heading towards a possible resolution to what was brought up um, during the Mercury retrograde station itself. And then eventually um, we get our second eclipse in May. I know this is like going ahead, obviously, but it's hard to talk about the first eclipse with, without talking about it being the first part um, in a series of like a one and mm -hmm. a two that are sort of like back to back in terms of eclipse season. We get that other eclipse in Scorpio at 14 degrees um, on May 5th. And then Mercury eventually stations direct here around May 15th. So right and Jupiter moves month. into Taurus the next day after the Jupiter directs or Mercury direct station. And then the moon hits a day or two after that. So like if we're looking for an answer, dude, yeah, we have a um visible in this in the morning sky mercury jupiter moon conjunction in taurus um in the middle of may you know if we're looking yeah. when do things look stable like that that looks well, like that looks very stabilizing it's sort of but then you get that giant alignment right around may what is it 18 19 20 21 with mars uh, pluto mars. jupiter t square so yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't put my bet on stability until that is over. Well, but I, I would argue that moves quick, whereas Mercury and Jupiter are going to hold there for a while, and they're in that nice morning rising. Mars is going to do a thing and then move on. I mean, certainly Jupiter, when it goes into Taurus, is going to attempt to reconcile and smooth over some of the things that the Mercury retrograde, the dust that Mercury retrograde sent up into the air and some of the chaos and stuff. Yeah. And I don't mean some sort of permanent lasting golden era stability. I just mean, you know, relative to the baseline uh, this year, especially yeah. especially relative to the second half of April. I basically agree with you. I, I do agree with you that the Taurus moving into uh, Jupiter moving into Taurus is kind of like things are starting to improve. I, I And I like that sextile that starts to form between Jupiter and Saturn. I mean, that's a fantastic aspect. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just worried about that that mid uh, that one crisis point there, uh, right. which is looks very uh, has some teeth on it. Yeah, it's like the because it goes back to the fixed sign thing, and it's like Jupiter's starting to push things back into alignment or starting to make things settle down again after a three week Mercury retrograde period and after two weeks of the chaos of eclipse season. But then, yeah, Mars moves into to Leo and starts needling things again, squaring Jupiter and opposing Pluto. Yeah, I think um, that's I think that's the beginning of the needling that Mars will be doing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we I think we'll really I think we we really get the Mars needling um, once Venus moves into Leo and Mars and Venus hang out together in Leo for months and then yeah. Venus goes retrograde. Yeah, because God hates fixed signs. That's true. <laughs> um, all right. So Just that- to rub it in, you know, uh, when Mercury stations uh, uh, retrograde that day, the, by the way, the moon is also conjunct Mercury and Uranus. <laughs> Just to like put a little exclamation point on that that Mercury uh, uh, station on Uranus that you were talking about before. That's funny. I'll put a little English yeah. on it. Well, <laughs> Instead well, of really like, okay, guys, this is going to be an intense day. Well, and I think this is activating the eclipse degree from like November, isn't it? Wasn't that like 16 degrees-ish Taurus? Yeah, well, and that gets, you know, I mean, the the, mm-hmm. the Scorpio eclipse on May 5th is like 14, 15 so okay. like it, you know this begins with oh this this is kind of a new eclipse uh with in aries right there's some different themes but it leads right back into the same scorpio taurus uranus thing that we've been doing for years now is there anything we would advise like not doing when mercury is stationing retrograde conjunct uranus and as far as people's like personal lives in a day-to-day basis like if you have a technological snafu like you're writing a long email to somebody and then your computer your your power goes out and the email gets erased you know you might have to do it over again obviously but there's like scenarios like that that are mercury uranus and and mercury retrograde type scenarios that one might encounter around that time and i guess part of the advice is just um patience be patient and anticipate the unexpected if you can which is very hard to do by definition but also just try to exercise patience and know that sometimes you may have to do things over again or spend more time doing something than you initially um, anticipated and the more flexible you can be in kind of rolling with that the the more success you'll probably have over the course of that month yeah 100 i would say leave room for problem solving don't Mm -hmm. assume that it's just going to go fine like you know budget that into your schedule the one thing I would not do is mess around with like electrical stuff if you don't know what you're doing on that aspect, because um, Uranus is associated with like, you know, electric electricity and electric shocks. Um, so that would be a don't unless you're an elect a certified electrician. But the other thing would be, I think this is going to be a hard aspect on the collective nervous system. Like Mercury Uranus is like, it's like a, it's like a, a short circuit of the nervous system can overload electrical energy into the collective nervous system. And that probably could be tied into the eclipse. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point because both of them have that energy, both eclipses and Mercury, Uranus, hard aspects. Here's the archetypal explorer graph again, just to show you sort of how Mercury holds that conjunction with Uranus most of the second half of the month due to that retrograde, which is very unique because usually it's like, Mercury is such a fast planet that usually when you get a hard aspect with Mercury Uranus, you will have a day that feels kind of like electric and will where communication is happening much more quickly. And sometimes you have unexpected communication or what have you. Um, but like you're saying, Mercury holding that for like several weeks almost kind of like amplifies the the electric quality of that energy, which might be a little harsh for some people in terms of their, their like nervous system or what have you. There's like a real paradox there because, you know, like we talked about earlier, Mercury is really slow in Taurus generally and slowing down and stationing, but Uranus is like quick, unexpected, sudden shock. So there's some kind of weird paradox there uh, that I don't fully understand, but it's going to be interesting to to watch. Well, I mean, a shocking event can paralyze onlookers. 
Oh, that's mm. a good, that's a good combination of those two factors. Thank you. A shocking events that paralyzes every, that like freezes everybody in place. Right. Cause you're like, now I don't know what to do. Right. I was going to do this. And uh, like, you know, you don't, you don't know how you haven't processed what the best response to something is because it happened too quickly. Yeah. Something, some kind of shocking news events could come out. Right. I mean, thankfully it's not technically exact. There's a little buffer of a few degrees there. Yeah. Well, and that makes know, a difference. Yeah, it does. And w- just one thing um, that we spoke about, but not wholly is so the, you know, shortly after the eclipse, the sun goes into Taurus. And then, you know, as we've been discussing, it's a lot of Taurus, Scorpio, Aquarius stuff. It's not the configuration of the last two years, but it kind of feels like it. Um, and I think we'll get a, you know, we'll get another, not a rerun exactly, but the continuing, um, like continuing stress on supply chains and food and energy, all of these, like, you know, these fundamental Taurus things. Yeah. So that is the sun going into Taurus. <clears throat> what do we got last part of the month? I didn't have any major aspects written down in terms of hard aspects um yeah i mean cards are kind of on the table right and we're just between the eclipses um you know kind of waiting for the 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 lunar and scorpio to drop but there's no more like no no other cards get turned over um until we get that lunar which is in may 5th you know what there's some one thing that's some, I mean, people, you know, may or may not know about eclipses too. It's like, you know, the timing of eclipses can take a while to really play out. It's not, it's not like right on the day, right? Like the orb almost of the effect is like for several weeks before and after it's like a, a drama that unfolds slowly reaches a peak and then, and then continues into that next eclipse. But, you know, April 19th is the day of the actual eclipse, but the effects are going to be felt pretty much throughout uh, much of the month. So even though yeah. there's no a- heavy aspects right after it, the after effect of the eclipse will continue for a week or two uh, in a- after that eclipse in April. Yeah, it's like the um, the shadow which falls across things during an eclipse is almost like sticky and oily and clinging right like the shadow kind of uh <laughs> it's more like getting sprayed by the eclipse like a little little tar little tar shower and it takes a while for to either get that scrubbed off or for it to get set on fire yeah i would really recommend people especially for this eclipse because it's the beginning of a new eclipse series that means it's going to be falling in a new whole sign house in your chart than the eclipses of fallen in quite a while so there should be some sort of theme of great beginnings or great endings when it comes to whatever the house is that um, Aries occupies in your chart and I would just think about that and pay attention to subtle beginnings or subtle endings that start taking place around that time because sometimes they can be big and momentous and like obvious just like an eclipse is obvious in the sky and that's what that's why ancient star watchers always mm. noted them as being so important. Um, but sometimes eclipses also can start things that have very humble origins and where you start working on something or you begin a new relationship or you start working towards some new career goal that doesn't seem super important at first. But then later in retrospect, you realize that that was the beginning of like a major new direction in your life. Um, so for for some people, especially if that's like a prominent part of your chart, um, that theme of endings and beginnings is going to be really significant. So pay attention to it. Especially um, in the sign of new beginnings. In Aries, sure. But we didn't talk about the conjunction to Jupiter. Um, what do you guys think about that? We talked about the square to Pluto a lot, but this eclipse is widely conjunct Jupiter. Um, which yeah. I think is part of that combustion and Jupiter yeah. continuing to be diminished. Yeah, I think it damages Jupiter. I think that um, for it kind of ties in with a couple of things where Jupiter's not going to be able to do very much until it gets into Taurus, right? Like there's the fact that it's still in combustion, 
Um, and generally having an eclipse right next to a planet damages the planet. It's combust anyway. It's it's um, almost out of shit. It's almost done with Aries anyway. I, I think it kind of reinforces that sense that like, we're not going to have uh, a Jupiter to believe in until it gets to Taurus. And then, you know, we may or may not like what it provides, but it'll be like providing again. I think for, for some people, <clears throat> depending on how their chart's set up, and as long as there's not any super difficult or challenging things that are overriding it, I do think that the solar, this being the solar eclipse that takes place and the last one um, while Jupiter's in the same sign, especially for people with day charts, that may indicate that whatever the major beginning is or the major ending is that takes place in your life at that time, that it may have more of a positive or optimistic sort of growth-oriented direction where things, even if something has to end at that point, it'll end up being a positive thing in the long term, hopefully, um, for, for some people, as long as there's not major counteracting things. So just combining that theme of eclipses representing major beginnings and and Jupiter sometimes representing mm -hmm. periods of growth and expansion and moving forward with something or affirming something, um, it could be somewhat positive for some people. All right, so we are getting close to the end of this episode. Are there any major things that we meant to mention in terms of some of the transits um, besides that? Are there any other it seems like the Sun Jupiter conjunction was one of the most on the 10th and 11th was one of the most positive things that we noted. Are there any other like major positive things that stand out that might be worth mentioning here um, to sort of end this on a, on a positive <laughs> note, despite some of the uncertainty and some of the chaos of some of the eclipse and Mercury retrograde things that we've mentioned? I think that Venus and Gemini, once Venus clears Saturn, clears the square to Saturn uh, in Gemini. Um, Venus will be fun. And Venus will actually probably maybe help, I don't know, maybe help stabilize Mercury a little bit. But um, the Venus in Gemini, when it's not encumbered, um, is uh, is fun. You know, it's, it's <laughs> distracting. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. It's engaging um, mentally, intellectually, playful, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we talked for a while about the kind of bummer of entering Gemini, um and getting pluto saturn but like that's over um in under a week for venus and venus can just kind of gallivant through gemini for the rest of the time mm -hmm. we kind of skipped mm -hmm. over april 7th this has like two favorable aspects that day the, especially the venus sextile to neptune um that's a nice aspect of falling in love and reading romantic poetry maybe going to see some live music um, that's one of the nicer aspects of April. Yeah, I had not mentioned the sextiles because usually we skip them, but this might actually be a good time to mention some of the sextiles this month for lack of other major positive aspects. Um, so here they are on Archetypal Explorer. You were mentioning which one? Venus Neptune? Venus Neptune on April 7th. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the end of the month has quite a few nice sextiles as well. Yeah, there's a Sun-Saturn sextile around the 24th, 25th, which is somewhat stabilizing um, and, you know, making positive steps very slowly towards something. Uh, there's a Mars-Uranus sextile on the 29th-ish, it looks like, um, which can be good for innovative action and um, making action and doing things in a way that's unique and um, not conventional, but being able to do that successfully rather than in a way that's disruptive or or backfires on you. Racing fast cars, having a little thrill. Yeah, little I don't taste know about racing danger. with uh, all that, uh, all the rest of the things going on with Mars Uranus. <laughs> Mars also is in its fall in Cancer. And uh, there was a question about what about the Mars Saturn trine? Um, right after the introduction i think that's interesting you know uh we've had so much frenetic mars over the last eight and a half months um and with mars going into cancer and finally leaving gemini and getting a trine from saturn right away it feels very marshy it feels kind of muddy it doesn't like there's a, there's a there's a kind of a sullenness to that but like you know a determined sullenness um, but it's it's not great for Mars. It's not like Mars is going from this nightmare into, um, you know, the uh, uh, 
yeah into something of magnificent it's kind of like slowed down and a little moody a little marshy um it's not um you know it's it's not um terrible um but it gets a little like slow and sullen Mm. I do have one, I have one positive. Okay. For, for April run really nice positive, but I had to go to Joe astrology to find it. April 22nd um, is the Ashaya Tritiya golden day of success. One of the most auspicious uh, days in, in Joe astrology of the year, because both the sun in Vedic astrology uh, in the, in the sidereal Zodiac, both the sun and the moon are exalted. Um, and it's supposed to be an, a very auspicious election in the Vedic system. So I, I, my Vedic out. teachers would not uh, would probably cancel that uh, or cancel the that as an election <laughs> with the sun conjunct Rahu three days after an eclipse. Um, but yeah, no, the, the double exaltation is totally a thing. You're supposed to buy gold on that day. It's supposed to bring you um, the, the it's the day of undiminished wealth. That's yes. the one of the most suspicious things is to buy gold. It's supposed to bring um it's supposed to bring um consistent wealth if you do that. I don't know on if that that's day. good good advice this year when Mercury is stationing retrograde conjunct Uranus and we're talking about all the sort of financial chaos of things that are going on at that time. But like <laughs> well, like, again, this is Vedic, so totally. <laughs> Um, that was the only thing I could find. I tried to find something really positive uh to put to put in there. I mean, I think for me, the most positive thing is going back to just, um, this is the last bit. Next month, Jupiter is going into Taurus, as Austin has said. So this is the last bit of Jupiter in Aries. Um, So while there will will be some chaos that's getting um, thrown up in the air by the Mercury retrograde and and everything else, um, there will be some major new beginnings and some people expanding and having positive beginnings in the Aries sectors of their chart. So I think really thinking about that and thinking about um, what it is that's changing in your in that sector of your chart and how you can grow it and nurture something that's new in that area um, to be a to grow into something more long term and more viable will be um, a really good thing to think about and take advantage of with the Sun Jupiter conjunction this month. So that's probably the most positive aspect around, especially around the um, 10th and 11th and everything else. All right. Um, well, thanks a lot. This is really good. We've covered a huge amount of ground here. Obviously, this is one of the more significant months coming up, and there's like so much happening, but it's nice to be able to both review a lot of the news stories that have been happening over the past month and what their astrological correlates have been, as well as to talk about and try to wrangle some of the different things that are coming up next month. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation. So thanks both of you for for joining me. Yeah, this was fun. This was awesome. I appreciate you guys inviting me on the show. Yeah. So, uh, Robert, where can people find out more information about you and what do you have coming up in the future? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Um, well, you can check out my website, which is astrocryptoreport.com. And that has like a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. I do a financial astrology project on Patreon, um, where it's, it's really focused on the cryptocurrency markets, but we look at all the global markets as well. And that's kind of my main thing that I'm doing right now. I have some courses in financial astrology on the website, but I'm on Twitter, pretty active at, at, at Astro Crypto Guru on Twitter. And we do a lot of, a lot of financial stuff, a lot of stuff for Bitcoin. Um, so check out my Patreon for that. Cool. Awesome. Austin, what do you have coming up? Well, um, what I have coming up is primarily what just happened. Um, my website was redesigned and relaunched. Uh, it was actually best birthday present ever from Kate. She surprised me. Um, and so it's stronger, faster, more navigable, less confusing, <laughs> clear. Um, it's really nice. It's really nice website, by the way. It really is. She does beautiful work. Yeah. And I um I, I also have been digging, I haven't put up any of the lectures uh, or classes or workshops that I've done at conferences and such for like five years. So I've started digging through those and I put up a bunch of stuff um, that I haven't made available before. Like I have a 30 hour ish uh, class on tarot and astrology that I taught a while back that I think is a lot of fun. And then there's lots of uh, smaller stuff too. And then um, speaking of communications and all that, um, Sphere and Sundry will be releasing the Mercury in Gemini series. 
um, sort of any minute now, maybe right around the time this comes out to the public. Um, and so it's a beautiful Mercury uh, Gemini election from last year. This is part of the Make Gemini Fun Again campaign uh, after Mars has, you know, Mars will have just left uh, Gemini after extensive depredations. So there'll be good, good, good Gemini energy um, to restore. And uh, and I've been told uh, that you did not, in fact, make a Mars and Gemini tal talisman, much to my disappointment. Yeah, last that's month. Yeah, I, uh, so Robert, I accidentally misspoke. I was like, oh yeah, we've got this Mars and Gemini series, right? As if anyone would need any more of that at this <laughs> point. I certainly didn't. <laughs> no, I'm I'm good. It was on my moon for months and months and months and months. Oh yeah, me too. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Gemini moons, nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's your website again, Austin? Oh, it's austincopic.com. Cool. Well, I'll put links to both of your websites in the description below this video on YouTube or on the podcast website for this episode. Um, as for myself, I am working on this revising and expanding my course on horary astrology with Rob Bailey. Uh, and we're actually like four lectures into it at this point. And what we've done is we're just going through and systematically revising and recording new lectures from my old horary course, which used to be just four core lectures that I recorded back in 2008 and 2009, and we're expanding it into a whole 12 part course. So wow. we've already recorded and, and released in the old course, the first three lectures, I believe, which is a welcome lecture, a very long workshop on the history of horary astrology, and most recently a lecture on the philosophy of horary astrology. So next week, we're going to record our first lecture on basic concepts and techniques that you need to know to practice horary. Then we're going to upload that to the website and keep adding one new lecture each month over the course of this year. So by the end of the year, it's going to be a full-fledged, huge course on horary astrology based using whole sign houses and the earliest techniques of the Arabic astrologers from the 8th and 9th centuries. So if people sign up for that now, they'll kind of get um, grandfathered into the current price structure, which is much lower now since it's not finished than it will be once we finish it and raise the price. So if people want to check that out, you can find more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. All right, that's it for this episode. Thanks everyone for joining me. Thanks our audience for joining us and all your comments in the live chat. It's been really helpful and it's helped guide the discussion in different ways. So thanks everybody for joining us and for your support through our page on Patreon. Uh, that's it for this episode. Good luck in April, and we'll see you again next month for the Astrology of May. All right, see you next time. A special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Mimi Stargazer, and Jean Marie Kaplan. If you appreciate the work I'm doing here on the podcast and you'd like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through our page on patreon.com. In exchange, you can get access to bonus content that's only available to patrons of the podcast, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the monthly forecast episodes, our monthly Auspicious Elections podcast, or another exclusive podcast series called the Casual Astrology Podcast, or you can even get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, visit patreon.com slash astrology podcast. If you're looking to get an astrological consultation, we have a list of recommended astrologers at theastrologypodcast.com slash consultations. The astrologers on the list are friends of the podcast that have been featured in different episodes over the years, and they have different specialties such as natal astrology, electional astrology, synastry, rectification, or horary astrology. You can get a 10% discount when you book a consultation with one of the astrologers on our list by using the promo code ASTROLOGYPODCAST. The astrology software that we use and recommend here on the podcast is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available for the PC at alabe.com. Use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we recommend a software program called Astro Gold for Mac OS, which is from the creators of Solar Fire for PC, and it includes both modern and traditional techniques. You can find out more information at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount. If you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then I'd recommend checking out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I go over the history, philosophy, and techniques of ancient astrology, 
taking people from beginner up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. You can get a print copy of the book through Amazon or other online retailers, or there's an ebook version available through Google Books. I also recently published a new translation of the anthology of the second century astrologer Vedius Valens, which is one of the most important sources for understanding the practice of ancient astrology. You can find that by searching for Vedius Valens the Anthology on Amazon or other online book retailers. If you're really looking to expand your studies of astrology, then I would recommend my Hellenistic Astrology course, which is an online course on ancient astrology where I take people through basic concepts up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. There's over 100 hours of video lectures, as well as guided readings of ancient texts, and by the time you finish the course, you will have a strong foundation in how to read birth charts, as well as make predictions. You can find out more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. I also recently launched a new course there called the Birth Time Rectification Course, where I teach students how to figure out your birth time using astrology when the birth time is either unknown or uncertain. You can find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. Each year the podcast releases a set of astrology calendar posters for the coming year, and we've just released our 2023 Planetary Alignments and Planetary Movements posters, which are now available on our website at theastrologypodcast.com slash store. There you can also pick up our 2023 Electional Astrology Report, where Lisa Scheim and I went through the next 12 months and we picked out the single most auspicious date for each month using the principles of electional astrology. You can get that at theastrologypodcast.com slash 2023 report. And finally, thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which is a quarterly astrology magazine which you can read in print or online at mountainastrologer.com. Finally, thanks also to the Northwest Astrology Conference, which is happening May 25th through the 29th, 2023, just outside of Seattle. This year's conference is going to be a hybrid conference where you can either attend online or in person. Find out more information at norwac.net.